Got you, yes. man. Sweet. Sweet. Okay. Fantastic. Oh, Sorry. There was a second click out and I was hiding behind a window somewhere. Is- <laughs> yes, but that's, that's the great. best background ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Huge. Man. How, how's my sound, guys? Is, is the sound okay? Yeah, that's sounds crazy. good, bud. Perfect. Fantastic. How's life okay today? Yes. Yes. Yeah, bud. Good, life eh? is good, man. Uh, for me, it's early. It's raining in London, so... You know, beautiful day. <laughs> Oz, Oz is uh, as it always is on the Gold Coast. It's warm and uh, and, and just good. perfect. Oh just man, that's yeah, that's good. How's it in South Africa this morning? Okay, actually, it's a, it's a bit more chilly this morning, but it's uh, it's going well. Um, yeah, like sort of like summer's creeping in again. It's actually quite nice. Because this is actually this is my little what I call this is my man cave basically. Nice. nice. So. I've got a studio set up sort of, um, where I've sort of decked it out a little bit like a coffee shop kind of vibe, all these low lights. And I use this for photography, for video, for cooking, for meetings now as well, for okay. everything. It's like this multi-purpose room. So looking around me, I've got like freezers, I've got a, like, like a, an oven, I've got coffee machines, I've got tons of like just equipment, every single spice under the sun, you know, it's like one of those kind of things. Yeah, like an alchemist, you've got your little... All your little magic like, happening in there. That's it. I've got all, all my all my backgrounds for like sort of photography and tons of lighting going on here. And oh my god, it's it's a it's a it's one of those messy rooms. There, I've, every concept I ever get in life, every, every bottle I like, every whatever it comes to this room. So it's quite a nice. mission, but organised. It. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, sorry, I, I was like my man. Of, it's like an episode of Stranger Things. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it's. <laughs> So like I've just actually moved myself up to a different location. Oh, uh, bad. perfect. You're smooth. So hopefully it's better. Okay. okay. All right, buddy. <laughs> and, Woo. And, and, unless you, there's a massive storm or it snows or something, nothing else. <laughs> uh, do you, you want to get yourself a whiskey or something, but <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Classic, but so so yeah, man. We're just super excited to chat with you. Um, awesome, yeah, ditto, man. It's, it's it's awesome. You guys are doing a great podcast. I mean, like, and, and I mean, you know, it was a few weeks ago or months ago when you interviewed old Bruce Lipton there. And it literally was quite a, a massive turning point in in my life and my and my sort of um, perception of stress and life and how everything comes together. Because like you're looking for all these rules, and that was the like like the one podcast that actually sort of brought everything together. I was standing That's in. Cool. At um, about to vote, and I, I went to one of the voting stations, and I never stand in queues. And I stood at the, <laughs> the voting station, and I was literally, uh, it was like a hell of a long queue. It was going so slowly. I could have gone somewhere else where it was far quicker, but I was like, no ways. I'm doing this podcast in the queue. Nice. I've got forever. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Man. Awesome, man. Yes. An amazing man, and he's he's uh, actually this weekend. There, I was at a seminar, and he went and gave like free talks to the students a few times uh and so some of the the guys that i was chatting to had been to they actually lecture he actually lectured them um uh and he said that this guy was saying what a like a wealth of information this guy is beyond just like the stuff we spoke about he's actually like a super smart guy apparently and uh oh. yeah i mean we also took so much from from his chat it was incredible but uh yeah man thanks for saying that that's super kind of you man Waking at dawn. Righty ho. Good morning there, Mr. Wayne Kaminsky. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Hey, guys. Awesome to be here. I've been looking forward to this completely. So, uh, lovely to be here. Yeah, yeah, Likewise. we've had, yeah, man, we've had a, we've had a bit of a um, experience setting things up this morning. That's for sure. It's always a, <laughs> a, a test of character sometimes. So, thanks. For, I guess true to life always. Yeah, there's always going to be a problem to overcome, and you just carry on going until they sort of go away. That's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but it's having that kind of flexibility and patience to to work through things, which is important, man. So. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, but so we actually met through this uh, WhatsApp group, which is kind of strange, but also kind of awesome. It's called yeah. Nerd Safaris. So we, I guess we're all technically like Nerd Safarians. And, um, Basically. Yeah. So we had the privilege of obviously, um, well, you and I, I had the privilege of meeting you a few weeks ago in London. You were like on a, on a trip uh, you know, in New York and, and the UK. And it was just epic to catch up with you for the first time. I just 
he just kind of like walked outside this coffee shop in Covent Garden and gave me this massive flipping man oak. <laughs> and I was like, straight away, I knew this oak was a good oak. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it was such good energy. So, you know, it was the natural response sort of like, hey, there you are. <laughs> Somehow, I feel like I know you very, very well already, and uh, let's get going. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome, man. Awesome, man. So, 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 Bud, you have like such an interesting story and like an amazing amount of wisdom to to share and like impart with with us and and our listeners. And um, but firstly, the cool thing is you're a Joburg boy through and through. So, like, high five to that. You know, 100%. Um, yes. So you know I mean? um, <laughs> and, uh, but so, so like, just take things back a little bit for us. I, I know uh, when you were a youngster, like your folks got divorced when you were 10 years old, but uh, maybe you can just tell us what it was like growing up in, in the Gauli, you know, like uh, the city of gold in, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Oh, man. So, I mean, like, you know, South Africa was, was a bit of a strange time sort of at that point, and, you know, things were changing quite a lot. Um, I, I mean, the country was going through a lot of flux. South Africa has been a super interesting country sort of, I mean, all along. And I, th I think it really sort of like changes your mindset. Um, for one, I think sort of, you know, growing up, there was always this case of like um, never following rules. Uh, I think one of the things about South Africa is you try and break all the rules that are, that are there. This is really instilled in you from the word go. Um, I, I think I was actually sort of super lucky. I, I had this sort of family around me who, um, I mean, you know, we weren't well off in any way. Um, we were just a basic normal family. But like, I was always told, you know, like, you you can achieve whatever you want to achieve you know and i mean like no matter how small the thing you were doing in life like you know if you were going to do a speech at school they were telling you you know what you are you know you are the person who can achieve you are reg applin's son <laughs> you are, <laughs> you've got god behind you you've got all kinds of things and so we had this sort of concept of like you know you can achieve anything and i think sort of living in south africa at that point in time um basically sort of you know school for me was a, was a thing of like I went to school for the social aspect of school. Um, to me, uh, uh, studying and, um, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, studying and doing homework were sort of foreign things to me. I would like to yes. uh, say to friends of mine in school, come on, guys, you know, what, what are you doing? Um, you know, after school, let's go cycling. I, you know, be a and they'd be like, no, no, there's loads of homework. And I was like, what homework? There's no homework. <laughs> and that was basically sort of me, you know, sort of going on, just enjoying the sort of cool aspect of school, enjoying the connectivity, um, just experiencing people around me and, and not really studying that hard. I've got no idea how I passed, how that is sort of a, a uh, university exemption and everything, but I literally just like scraped through school. Um, I decided even in matric in the final year that I would not study certain subjects. I mean, there was there's certain, certain books I would never read. I, used to, I threw them away and I never read them. Um, and I decided even before the exams, that just to make sure that I wouldn't even be tempted to study them, I threw away all the material. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know so i guess from the word go it was a case of like be a rebel get out there you know make life happen on your own terms and i think that's where it all came from yeah that's, that's so classic but so so but when your own kids do that you almost like you just kind of got to accept it hey like uh. oh man and i've got three kids and i'd say three out of three now like we don't need the school thing what you know like oh. You've already taught us that school is um, <clears throat> it's not important anymore in the, the subjects you learn. It's more about the sort of like the concept of learning and it's more about the bigger picture. And like we don't like these systems. So, yeah, I've, I've uh, made life very hard for myself in that sense. Where the, yeah, the kids are like, no ways. We don't do the school. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a part of you that's probably super proud of them as well. You're like, to, you know, like, yes, you, you go, you know, you don't stick to the... You know, don't just follow the man, so to speak. That's the way. And I mean, you know, I sort of uh, two out of the three so far have, have already launched their own businesses, you know, before they were like 16, 17, you know, sort of launching businesses and trying things out. And I think that was just kind of like the way it was going to go. They were, they were never supposed to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> Almost very boring. So, so, so Wayne, let me look. I mean, you were a youngster um, in the day in Joburg when it was quite a transitional time, as you said, politically and all these kinds of things. Um, yeah. What was actually what was Joburg itself like, and 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 what were the some of the memories of that sort of transitional period? Sure. Well, I guess the big thing was sort of um, as apartheid was coming to an end, like you were sort of seeing, you know, this whole ridiculous concept of apartheid was coming to an end. Um, you know, you were all sort of terrified of what was going to happen. You know, there was a lot of propaganda against the AMC and we were all sort of like told, you know, watch out. And remember at school, we, you know, we had to do patrols around the schools looking for bombs and, and um, you know, you had to sort of like go around looking for terrorists and like we 
worried about everything around you. Um, and there was a sort of like real sort of like sense of like, I need to watch out what's going on. There's this crazy stuff around us. And then, you know, um, yeah, it, it just sort of like made you think about life a bit more. I think, you know, it was what is going on. There's all these people who sort of are not allowed to come into our areas. And we kind of like, my family was very, very sort of left wing in that sense. And they, they were like, we were smuggling people into our, into the areas and they were staying over with us sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it really sort of opened your mind up and thinking like, well, what's going on? Why are these people sort of like being ostracized? And I think that that formed a large part of what I was, um, you know, just trying to sort of like defend people and, and, and ask questions about sort of, a, you know, what's happening in South Africa. And then seeing the transition happening quite quickly, like sort of like we're moving towards something, you know, um, Nelson Mandela has been released from prison. Um, that was an incredible day. Like we were actually sort of quite terrified, you know, what's going on. Um, didn't realize how great the man actually is. <laughs> and, um, I think we had this just, I think South Africa was just, it was a small minded place in some ways. Um, we were sort of outside of the whole world um, platform. So South Africa was a place where nothing really big happened in a way, because um, you know, there was all these um, sanctions against South Africa. Mm -hmm. But the same way you were pushing like mad, you know, you, you, we all thought we were so far behind the rest of the world that we would never ever sort of like sort of be there. And once we were sort of readmitted into the world, like we saw how, how sort of our rugby teams were, mm. they thought they were so bad, but they actually then went and won the Rugby World Cup in a sense. And we thought we were so bad on all kinds of things, and yet we had pushed so hard. Um, so I think sort of, that was South Africa. It was a, cra it was a crazy place. Um, you're trying to find your place in the world. You're trying to find your place sort of in your own country. Um, nothing made sense. You had to look for sort of new meaning. And yeah, that was, that was the Joburg I knew. It was, it was quite rough. It was quite... Um, wasn't a pretty place. Um, wasn't as advanced as overseas. Uh, we had some really backward systems here, and uh, yeah, but it, but it made us we were. It made us very resourceful. I think that was South Africa gave us the gift we got from South Africa was being very resourceful on, on how life worked, thinking about it, looking out there, being a rebel. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, I and couldn't agree more. To that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I, as well, Craig. I, like I couldn't agree more. Like I think. We don't really know, or, or you know, we're not really that conscious of it, but um, it really did prepare us and, and gave us certain skills and ways of thinking and like this sort of maybe this toughness that you actually do need in life, you know, and um, also a good work ethic, I think. Like, yeah. you know, South Africans work flipping hard, like, you know, and... Uh, flipping hard, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and th that is, I think, you know, because of that sort of competitive way we've kind of been brought up and, and everything like that so uh, totally related but and uh, it's quite wow. funny that you mentioned like the rugby because and and we were like sanctioned and like sort of we we couldn't compete in sports i remember when we played in the i think it was the i can't remember the year that we first played the cricket world cup um but um the one sign it was in australia anyway was like uh, south africa unbeaten from 1972 to 1992 or something like that and i was like i was like that is just excellent it was the best best sign ever and um yeah yeah so, yeah yeah so so but also talking about things and like sports and stuff you mentioned like you know you 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 kind of uh weren't maybe like into academics massively at school um but you and but you did play a bit of sports and you also did bicycling or bmxing um but yeah. you actually stopped bmxing when you were 18 because of a certain photo that you saw <laughs> <laughs> exactly well there's actually two things and, and so one was um i decided to do this um demo to my class on on, on bmxing and jumping over things ramping and bunny hopping and all kinds of things endos and you know on one <laughs> Thing. And um, I took some photographs and um, I saw myself and I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> a fully grown sort of semi-adult um, on a article that is absolutely tiny. And, and, and it just made me think, I can't do this anymore. Like I went from a sort of like, like hero of like, I love BMXing to the next day is thinking, you know what, mom, please drive me to school. <laughs> <laughs> then you grew up, you became a man. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I think about a week before that as well, I was like flying down to school sort of on the road on my BMX and um, I was going in between the traffic and this guy was on a pavement on the sidewalk and, and he stepped into the traffic. So I started jumping onto the pavement, went back to the pavement, I jumped off the pavement and onto oh, the road. Yeah. Got back and eventually I, I, and I was coming down a hill. It was, it was quite a sort of steep hill coming down quite fast. And I jumped onto the pavement with one foot dragging behind me straight into a wall. 
Oh. And, and, I, and I got shot directly over the wall, into the person's yard, over, over all their plants and everything, tumbled there, got up, yes. up, back over the wall again, and there was my deputy headmaster of the school <laughs> sitting in his car, crying, crying, crying. <laughs> and, I mean, and um, I got to school, and he didn't even like sort of say, you know, are you okay? He just laughed like hell. I got to school, and he came and found me and said, please, please do that again. It was the best <laughs> I've had in ages. So I think between those two occurrences, I decided, yeah, it's time for like mom to take me to school. Um, uh, it's classic. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very South African thing too. Eh? Like have a laugh at someone's uh, expense and uh... <laughs> no one, no one's gonna help you. No one's gonna help you up. You're just like, uh, healthy. You're not bleeding. You can get up yourself and go. Yeah, hard <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when your your actual your later on uh, your first career was in uh, sort of graphic design, what sort of led you down that pathway? Oh my gosh. So um, you know, not being able to you know. Because I wasn't academic at all, I, uh, you know, sort of didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I used to sit in, in our, um, one of our classes at school where we had to choose your careers. And I'd literally flip through the thing with my, put my hand on something and say, I'll do that. And, and, I, and I'd read that and think, no, that sucks. And I'd carry on. So my mom said to me, Wayne, you've got to decide. You have to decide what you're going to do in life. Because uh, you're in the trick now. We need to get you doing something. So I uh, need to decide by tomorrow. So I was watching that. That um, series called "Who's the Boss?" You remember Tony Danza? Oh, yes, Tony Danza. Yeah. That was and uh, at, and, and, and exactly. <laughs> 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 and then and then An, um, Angela. Now Angela, the um, the woman there was she was in advertising, and I watched it and I was like, that looks cool. She's hot, and I think <laughs> I should do advertising. So I said, "I'm going to advertising." <laughs> so oh, it was Jesus. literally chosen by watching. Uh, who's the boss? Who's the boss? <laughs> <laughs> and then I decided, well, let's go into graphic design. And I hadn't done art at all. And um, I literally, my you know, mom was like, you need to get a portfolio together. So I was like, okay, cool. And I just sort of somehow got a portfolio of, of art together. I went along, <laughs> um, I went along to the Bits University um, for a for a winter um, a winter course. It was like sort of a winter holiday course. You were there for a week. And, the, and they had the actual graphic design institute teaching you how to do graphic design and there's a whole about probably 100 people there or so testing it out and um i just couldn't agree with any of the um teachers uh, you know some of the lecturers there i was like what the hell i mean they made us sit there for days drawing circles and coloring in circles with with things and like doing things which i thought was like this is ridiculous how do you apply this to real life and and so i didn't get on with any of the um lecturers and eventually when they when they gave me my um assessment at the end of that week they said to me um we would suggest that you choose another career <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, so i said to them you know what i disagree with you like i think i'll be great at this and I, because i don't see any common sense in what you guys are doing the way you've taught this whole week makes no sense to me how to apply to the real world and i'm gonna go and do it so i went along and i mean you know like i went from from there getting into graphic design and, and going all the way to a creative director level. Um, you know, even in London, I was working at that. And uh, I mean, it was actually sort of like, you know, come on guys, um, I just couldn't agree. Don't let others tell you that you can't do something if you really feel you can. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but that's, that's incredible. What a, what a good attitude, you know, and uh, especially at such a youngster, you kind of like, you just seem to know what you, you wanted. And um, <laughs> um, that's cool, man. And also like, uh, you also got married when you were pretty young as well, didn't you? When you were like 23. Yeah, exactly. I think I sort of, I started off being quite religious and it was a sort of kind of like, it was the next step. You had to do this. And, um, you know, I've, I've changed a lot since that point. I think that's crazy. But it was actually, yeah. So, you know, got married very young and decided to actually literally get married. Um, we, were, we were two weeks of honeymoon and from there just went directly overseas. I uh, decided to go for a year of backpacking and traveling. There was no way we were going to settle down. And literally went like you know it was like two weeks of honeymoon which we were bored we were bored about by about day seven i think um, then we actually came back early to Joe, saw our friends headed off to overseas um, to israel landed in israel went to a kibbutz joined a kibbutz supposedly for three months um worked there and i thought oh, this is this is crazy this is this is pure socialism um i literally you go to the kibbutz you sort of they give you a job to do and there was like things like working on you know there was there was working with turkeys or there's working on a fish farm or working with all kinds of things. 
working in a paper factory. And I was like, you know, I can finish my work in probably half an hour for the whole day. I've got to be here for eight hours, but I can finish my work in half an hour and I could pack way more. I said to the guy, come, I'll, I'll, I'll do like the whole week's work right now. And he was like, don't, <laughs> you'll make us all look bad. And I was like, this is, <laughs> come you know? like, I mean, I can make, I can, you know, I can make you guys more money. This is, this is simple. And um, I think after about a month at the kibbutz, it was like, I had enough of like socialism and that's, and that aspect, it was lovely to get free milk, free cheese and free food and all kinds of things and have a real safe life. But to me, it didn't work. You know, like, you know, <laughs> I want to push harder. So we literally walked out of the kibbutz, traveled around Israel and went, to, went to, after that to Egypt and Turkey and Greece and around the world and then worked overseas. Eventually got, you know, got to London, worked in a pub. And so that was our sort of like extended honeymoon was actually literally just traveling around the world. Huh, uh, cool, man. Yes, well, yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a, a, lot of fun, a lot of fun, but a very, very typical uh, Wayne thing is like, come on, let's get this business uh, into shape here. And uh, <laughs> it's classic. Totally, but, yeah. <laughs> and South Africa obviously was was very much on the other side of anything that sniffed of sort of socialism or anything like that. Anyway, you know, so you were okay. you were probably like. <laughs> that was great. Right now that you were super ambitious and determined and obviously a brave kind of guy, uh, which play out more, uh, you know, as we hear your story unfold. But uh, you also got involved in, the, as you said, the web development in 97, and then you moved to London. How was that experience? Yeah, oh, absolutely awesome. So, you know, I'm in graphic design now. Um, I've sort of been promoted in, in a graphic design agency in South Africa, and it was a really awesome place to work. We just, it was purely about, Super hard work. We I used to work like almost seven days a week, but I was I was loving it. And you know, you know, I sort of get up in the mornings early and cycle like three hours before work, and then do a meditation, and then get to work. And we'd work super hard, and we'd really party like mad, and, and have a good time. And um, I sort of got to the point where, like, sort of in graphic design, pure graphic designer, I felt there's a real ceiling. You know, like you know, I can design things. I can design. You know, we can do, we've launched magazines, and we've done cool things, and we've won some awards or whatever. But, but I needed more than that. There was, you know, I needed something to sort of like be a bit more interesting and a bit more difficult in a way, challenging. So um, out came this whole web thing and there was a couple of guys who were or programmers who were building websites for people. It was really, really early days where people were like, what is this web thing? And we were on a 33.6 modem at that point. I think, I think my, probably still had, no, I think my first modem was probably a 33.6 or slower actually. And it was crazy. So, I um, mean, you know, you're working there and I think, okay, let's actually sort of start designing these cool websites, you know, I can see this is 1997, so or 1996 probably. Um, I can see where this is all going. Um, so we started working with some, with some of these programmers to, to develop websites for us. And I designed this lacquer website, and it would come back looking nothing like I'd even designed. And I was like, dude, can you even see what you're doing? Like, you know, like this looks nothing. And I say to the guy, look here, here's the picture, and here's your website that you did for me. And he was like, yeah. I said, they don't look the same, even. <laughs> And he was like, no, no, but it's really hard. And like, and whatever else. And we worked with these guys. And I thought, hang on a second, I can do this myself, I'm sure. So there was no books out at that point. There was not a lot of books out on, on the web. There was really nothing. I mean, I would download software where there was no um, manual yet. And just sort of sit there for like night after night after night, trying to work out what's going on. And I just loved this whole thing called the web. I eventually built a whole bunch of websites and some cool things. And in those days, every web page had to be like literally Probably about sort of 50, 50 to 70K was your maximum size. It was tiny. This is your whole web page with all the pictures, all optimized. So then I decided, you know, like, um, to uh, move to London. Um, got to London. I've been doing these websites for quite a while. I was supposed to launch a business actually, an essay, like, like a whole web development business. And the kind of the management sort of contract fell through. And I, was, I had some partners and we said, no, no, this is, this is not going to work out. I literally packed up. Went to the UK. Um, my sort of wife at that point was actually sort of over there as well. She had decided to move over as well um, before me, actually. And uh, literally, I went over, started working on website stuff. And I was told by people in, in, in the UK, sort of, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, job agents, job finders, and you know, uh, they were saying to me, you can't be a designer and a builder of a website. They're two separate roles. And I said, no, I can do both. They said, no, it's impossible. You must decide which one you want to do. So I carried on going my own way, and literally about six months later, they launched a new job called a new media designer role, which was now someone who could do some development 
and some design, and then it was easy. So after that, there, you know, we were going through the whole dot com bubble. We were building up towards the dot com, you know, two thousand bubble, and everything was amazing. Everyone wanted to spend money on 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 web. There was tons of budgets for everything. There were so many jobs available. Everyone was paying huge salaries. It was a wonderful, wonderful time, um, and everyone had an idea, and everyone thought their idea was worth like, you know, twenty billion dollars, and uh, like sort of quite pathetic in general. And then I got more and more involved in programming after that. There, um, eventually started actually sort of even um, training people sort of in London. So I was doing on some of the advanced courses in London, the sort of web, web development, web design courses. I was probably training sort of eighty percent of the courses in, in certain areas. In London, so yeah, I went quite far. Decided, you know, hang on a second. Like, if you just apply your mind, surely you can learn. And I used to read these thick manuals, uh, programming manuals, and they made no sense the first three times, probably. <laughs> 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 and I'd read, I'd read them anyway, and just like slowly but surely, that makes sense. Or a year later, I'd be like, oh yeah, I read about that concept. That makes great sense. <laughs> so that, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow, well, but yes, man, it's it's so like inspiring just like kind of listening to how you just sort of, you know, you you just get your head down and you you just do things for yourself and you kind of learn it and you and you find your own path and um from from when we we caught up, I remember you saying like uh, I think you worked for like a a couple of corporates in London and then you're like, you know what? Stuff this I'm actually going to go freelancing and um and and that's what you did, didn't you? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I First of all, I went for about 20, 26 different um, agencies, uh, sort of um, advertising agencies and different sort of companies that were doing different things in London, just to get experience everywhere. I wanted to see across the board and I did specialist retouching for Photoshop and I did specialist other things as well. And then more web development as well. And eventually sort of, um, you know, when I had my first kid, um, Luke, um, someone convinced me to sort of say, you know, come and work permanently. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to just, you know, come and have a nice sort of like standard safe job and, um, you know, I can spend more time with my son and just have like a normal life going forward. And I worked there for six months and then, and I resigned seven times. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I literally resigned seven times and the guy was like, please, not this month, not this month. Just, you know, we're, we're, we're in a flux. Just can you please stay a bit longer? I was like, cool, but I can't do these rules. Um, or whatever, and eventually I got to a point where I just couldn't do it. Went to my own, and then that was it. I just literally, yeah, do my own thing. So, so that was about late 2000, I think, where I started doing my own thing, and then I've never worked for anyone else since then again. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Rules and, and yourself just uh, are like oil and water, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Not so good, eh? <laughs> so, when um, London had sort of served its purpose, and you, you headed back to South Africa in around 2003. Uh, worked in development and also as a social media coach. Tell us more about that. Yeah, exactly. So I got to the point sort of in London where I was like, I mean, the plan was never to be in London that long. Um, it was supposed to be three to six months initially, and we ended up doing almost six years in the end. Um, uh, and um, I, you know, decided like, you know, we were really passionate about South Africa at that time. I was like, you know, this country is amazing. We we just love what's happened in the culture. We just love what you know Alba has done. We're so proud of our flag. I mean, I was probably the most proudest person in the world about you know, our new flag and our new culture and our new country. I was like, you know, I want to come back to this country and be part of sort of building the country. So, you know, came back, um, set up my own business. I mainly had sort of international clients at that point in time only. I actually only had international clients for the first couple of years, like US, UK and all around the world. And um, I live my life on conference calls, flying places. Like I get a call and someone would say to me, you know, um, can we meet tomorrow morning? And I'd be like, yeah, no problem. Uh, I'll meet you at this office in London. <laughs> and we just, I'd just be, book a ticket off for the call, fly out. Um, yes. And, you know, it was, it was pretty wild. Then I sort of, sort of, the web started changing a lot. I mean, obviously after the dot-com, you know, sort of bubble burst, um, everyone, like, you know, all these great ideas and this huge amount of money that sort of like just didn't go anywhere. People spent it on huge things. That, as I say, I think sort of most, most startups in, you know, around the world, and spent their money on on um, three things. It was caviar, concord, and and um, <laughs> and cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that was what sort of. I mean, like the money went nowhere. Actually, all these guys with great ideas never achieved anything. So I mean, the web moved on quite a bit, and people sort of became a bit more sort of like realistic about goals and how do we how do we get real value out of out of sort of web stuff there. And then social media came along, and obviously we saw a huge change in social media, and it was really exciting. 
So I thought, well, let me go down and take all the skills I've got, like, you know, the design and management and, uh, you know, web design, web development, all kinds of things, and, and sort of hook on a bit of my like social media as well. And got involved in sort of the, I mean, it was early days of social media then, you know, uh, but it was social media plus, um, uh, you know, um, just online stuff, Google Analytics and, and just general sort of like being on the webness, you know, and, yeah. and it was just sort of like giving me sort of opportunity to look at the big picture because very often when you're a graphic designer or, or in advertising, people have a very small mind. So they like look, look at the thing and say, well, cool, I'm going to design this amazing poster or this brochure or this leaflet or this logo and this is going to change the world. And I can just realize much more to that, there's connection to people and I think this is what social media was doing. It was like, connect to people. You've got to actually sort of convince them. You've got to bring them into the brand. You've got to build the brand. You've got to have real value. You've got to do all these kind of things just to make it work. And I think that that's what I saw and I thought, okay, cool. Social media is the next step towards that. You can connect to people. You can build a brand. You can actually talk to them. I mean, podcasting was out there sort of in the early days. It was like really early day podcasting. And I got, I got involved in some crazy podcasts at that point. It was people sort of like convinced the world was going to sort of fall apart within two weeks. And it was all <laughs> like sort of conspiracy theories and people sort of selling homes and moving in with these crazy leaders. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean... It, it was an exciting time, actually. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, man. Wow, it, it, it's so interesting just listening to like you know uh, you and and how you kind of adapt to things. It, it's really fascinating. We had John Sane on our uh, podcast recently, and and he mentioned um, you know like the the thing that's actually going to help people in the future is their adaptability and their flexibility to all the changes that are going on. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you obviously, you've had this your whole life, so. Without a doubt. I mean, it's absolutely crucial. I mean, there's only one thing. So, I mean, like, you know, we, we sit around at the office nowadays and, and um, I've got my two brothers in the business as well um, as shareholders. And um, the one brother loves doing these, these Clifton Strength Finder tests. And we go through all our tests and what we do. And obviously, you sort of, uh, I come up very high as loving adaptability and change and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But, um, but a lot of people don't. And the thing is like, I mean, like, I don't know how you survive nowadays. How can you possibly survive if you don't accept that change is a standard part of life? And that change, change happens whether you like it or not. I mean, even if you live, like, let's say, a perfect life, like you're going to basically sort of go and live in the bush, um, you know, thousands of years ago, potentially even, and you're going to go and like, just like be a hunter gatherer or you're going to fish in a fishing village or something. Something will change. There'll be a flood, there'll be, there'll be ice, there'll be snow. There'll be hurricanes. There'll be wild animals coming through. Your neighbors will attack you. There'll be an earthquake. There'll be something. And nowadays, it's the same thing. There's always going to be change. Change is going to be thrust upon you no matter what you do. So, so one thing you really, really, really need to do is accept that change is actually fine and actually understand that change is a critical part because every single day, you are changing. After every meal, after every sleep, your, 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 your bio, your, your, body, your body's bacteria changes after, starts changing after every meal. Your mind changes, your fitness changes, the weather changes. You've got to get used to this. And I think it's, it's a critical thing. As John says, he's actually a friend of mine. We've done lots of walks down in Cape Town together. Um, and uh, he's completely right. Like you have to be able to sort of like accept change, be able to work with change and actually embrace change because it is the only thing that is constant is change. Yeah, critical. It, yeah. It's interesting because we, we get lulled into the sense in the modern world that, that it's sort of stable. You know, you, you take your kids to school in the morning you meditate, whatever, you know, you have your little routines and you, you can quite easily fall into that trap of feeling like, oh, it's just it, every day is more or less going to be the same. And then when something does rock your boat, it's a massive disaster. But like what you're saying now, it's, it's quite fascinating. Is like, that's only been there. That's the only constant there's ever actually been is that there will be changes. And, and it's just such a good idea just to embrace that, that sort of attitude with everything in your life. Yeah. And realize that, I think I don't know where this notion came from. I think sort of, I see with, with many, many people, uh, obviously I think our ultimate aim in life is to be happy. I mean, you want to be happy. Um, and and the, we're on this endless search for like this incredibly hard thing to achieve called happiness. And what happens is like we thought, or many people have thought that happiness was in the um, consistency. Happiness was a, I've planned, I've got insurance, I've got this, I've got that. Um, I want to keep my life safe. I'm going to protect myself against, you know, the lions or the proverbial lions trying to kill me, you know, or, or the boss at work that's hard on me or whatever. I'm going to try and create a nice, 
simple life where I said, amble along. Change is so necessary. I mean, like, if you don't have change in your body, if you don't have change in your diet, you actually, um, in your mindset, in your friends, in your environment, in your season, your body's not going to function properly. Like, you need uh, seasons. You need seasons. Every three months, there's a, a minor change. Every six months, there's a, in, in theory, there's a major change. So, for, you know, big seasons, warm, cold. And every three months, you've got to get used to these small changes. Every week, there's a change. So it's critical that we don't see consistency as the way to achieve happiness. Mm -hmm. Embracing change and actually sort of being cool about that. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, so, so it's, uh, yeah, so many lessons in there, but definitely. And uh, yeah, just like you said, let's embrace that change because um, it also helps us grow as a person, you know, to kind of deal with that. Um, so talking about change, I guess for you, life started getting even more interesting around 2009 when you were competing like in ultra endurance events uh, and races, you were super fit as well, but your health was kind of going backwards almost, wasn't it? Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So you get to that place where you're about 40 years old, you're coming onto the 40 years. I think I see a lot of guys doing this and you, you're, you're getting to that stage. <laughs> Um, you know, especially if you had kids and everything like, okay, I need to sort of find some space. I, you know, all I seem to do is work, you know, come home, deal with kids, change nappies, get up at night time, do all kinds. It really is hectic. So I got to the point where I thought, okay, cool. You know what? Actually, I really need to be fit again. Uh, I really want to get into triathlons or sort of long distance stuff. I want to get back into a bike and do cycling. So I decided to sort of at a, you know, um, at one point just to sort of go and do the Cape Epic. Now, Cape Epic is probably, it's arguably, well, well one of the toughest races in the world, uh, mountain bike races. Um, and it's basically the eight day, it was eight days at that point. And you'd go and cycle through the mountains for eight days. Now, a friend of mine and I decided, hey, let's just go and cycle this, this, um, this uh, race. It sounded like a nice ride. Like we thought, hey, we would love it. <laughs> and, and cycle for like, you know, sort of um, eight, <laughs> eight days. And then like, the race was in like a, in, in, in April and it was December now. Of just 20th of December, I eventually worked quite and down quite a bit, and I was like, I took some time off. I got away, and I sat down, and I sort of said, okay, I must read the the, the material they've actually given us on, on, on the race. And I read it, and I thought, oh, my God, what have I got into? This is not a ride. This is like, <laughs> like you know, up to 180 Ks, you know, in a day. This is like sort of climbing, you know, over those eight days, 16,000 meters of climbing on a, on a bike. It's incredibly hard. And I said, and I, and I call, I said to my friend, you know what, dude, unless you are training exceptionally hard right now, there's no way you're going to make this. So you've got to think about this. Either you've got to train. He was like, no, I want to go on holiday and have a chill. I'll start training in January. I said, you can't start training in January. This is the Cape Epic. It is, it is the hardest race in the world at the moment. And he was like, okay, he'll pull out. So, so I went like balls to the wall. I went hardcore, got into it. Like I literally, in those four months, I mean, I hadn't done any exercise for, for a while, like a long, long while. And I got on the bike. And within, within two weeks, I was going from, uh, I was doing six hour cycles because I started, yeah. I, had, no I had to be cycling far and I literally would cycle everywhere. I just, it was, I was mad. So this is the whole journey that started with, with, was getting fit. And I thought, well, actually cool. You know, obviously being fit is healthy. Then also I saw a dietitian who was a really sort of high end dietitian. Like, you know, I mean, she's consulting around the world and she's, <laughs> well, you know, it's just simple. Diet is simple. It's just calories in versus calories out. I was like, okay, yes. cool. You know, like, um, I'm, you know, like on average, I should probably eat about 1,800 calories. And then, um, you know, on the days I burned 10,000 calories, I was like, well, you can't, you can't eat 10,000 calories extra above that. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so what I did was, you know, like I carried on pushing like mad, did the race, and it was an incredibly hard race. Uh, you know, I lost two partners along the way, just like fell out and knee injuries and just couldn't make the race. It was very, very hard. A very, very tough race. We were, you know, in, in, in um, rain for like 10 and a half hours the one day, just no ways. stuck in the rain, uh, in the mountains. And oh, and so, I mean, it was amazing though, but like sort of, uh, you know, very hard. What I realized after that there, as I started pushing more towards doing Ironman and, and, and like um, bigger races, bigger and bigger races where I'm training sort of massive. I mean, like my average weekend race would be, or ride would be like four in the morning. I'm on a Saturday morning, I'm out cycling, um, you know, cycling till, and, and, and running and swimming until four or five that afternoon, you know, you, yes. you know, eventually doing like a 12 hour exercise session wasn't much for me. It was easy, you know, like you just, it was simple, you know, when you're doing the Ironman, you know, like you're doing the sort of full Ironman, 
Um, a 12 and a half hour day isn't really that long anymore. You're just so fit. You are absolutely in the, in the top 1% of the world at that point as fitness goes. Downsides to me was um, I thought I'd be super skinny, like, you know, all fat was gone because I'm burning so many, so many calories. I thought I'd be super healthy, and I wasn't. Mm. 2009, 2010, I found myself on literally, um, you know, 14 courses of antibiotics over those two years. I literally lived on antibiotics at one stage, like nonstop. Yes, yes. It was, I wasn't massively overweight, but I was still overweight. And here I am working my ass off. I'm trying to eat better. I'm making like better choices. Like I'll have, you know, I'll have whole wheat bread or I'll have this or that. I'm trying to make better choices. Or if I go and, you know, I'm running around and it'll be like, okay, which pie is the best pie? Like I get to a, <laughs> Pepper to steak. a garage. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I thought maybe that the, the sausage roll would be quite good because if you could peel off <laughs> half the sausage roll outer, I figured that was the most amount of protein. But uh, you know, I had no idea about ingredients in those days. And it was like, so, you know, I'm super unhealthy. Um, my mental state is shot. I'm literally, I, I, had, uh, I was diagnosed with having um, sort, of, sort of adult ADHD. And they were putting me onto concerts and all kinds of um. things. You've got to focus because my focus was shot. I couldn't focus properly. Um, my sort of work was sort of, you know, my work um, quality was sliding off. Um, and I, I, look, I was burnt out as well. I've been working sort of like just way too hard. But what I found was literally, um, even though I was super fit, I was super unhealthy. I was still overweight. My focus was shot my, and my emotional state was horrific at that stage. So a lot of bad things started happening. So yeah, um, basically eating is far more, there's a lot of things behind that. You've got to eat well. You've actually got to do all kinds of things to, um, yeah, just exercising alone is not enough. Mm. There's so much in there to, to, to discuss, actually. Like, it's just unbelievable how we've been led down the sort of path of more exercise means better, more longer sessions means more ripped and more skinny and more. And it's just crazy how so many people believe that. And the worst is that the dietitians are promoting this. Well, it's sort of slowly changing, I think, but it is, yeah. but, but not, not fast enough. Like Gareth and I were talking about it earlier, like um, in the hospitals, like this is a place of supposed health. And, yeah. and here you have people still eating in this day, like in this day and age, eating um, jelly and fruit juices and uh, custard. And yeah. this is, purely just based on how many calories do they need to eat in a day. And it's just, it's just shocking, man. Jeez. No, it is. I mean, like, I think sort of, we we're taking down the wrong route. I mean, it, it, this, is, this is the sad thing about, you know, science in a way and, 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 and the medical industry and commercialness is that, I mean, like, like we know now for like 50, 60 years, the scientists proved again and again and again that you are fat because of lack of exercise, not the sugar. You know, you had diabetes, you had cancer, you had all kinds of things because of other things, not because mm. of sugar and bad food and the preservatives and the additives and all the junk. And that's shocking that, I mean, like, you know, we actually sort of, we put our trust in these guys and they, and they carried on sort of like just like spewing out this junk, you know, absolute rubbish, garbage information. And then so many of us sort of in our subconscious minds, we've still got this program running saying, you know, I must work harder, I must push harder, I must exercise harder, you know, and, and I must still, you know, white bread is okay because someone told me it was okay you know i read it in an article somewhere by some scientist or some statistician or some sort of like medical person and that's rubbish eh? you know um yeah yeah uh, yeah i almost, almost have like a, a bar one and like a coke you know just before my race because my energy God. levels would be epic <laughs> Gosh, eh? which is madness absolute madness so we so we have woken up a lot and there's this great information out there but there's still a lot of people who just don't understand, you know, what it takes to actually lose weight and to be healthy and to be happy, to be honest, in the end. Yeah. Mm. yeah and I, I, wanna, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole now. We'll come back to it a little bit. But just yes. talking about, you know, g g being on multiple doses of antibiotics and, and there, there was no talk of like, like rest and all these things. It's just, mm. it's just uh, so good that you're bringing these things up and we'll, we'll delve further into them in a sec. So right, they are. maybe... Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, the, your venture into entering uh, MasterChef. Oh, gosh. So um, I'm sort of going along. Uh, I was, um, I, I just got divorced or going through a divorce and uh, sort, of, sort of ending it all off there. And, uh, you know, 
I was using um, life coaches at that point. I started to sort of get a life coach on board. And I was also using um, you know, psychologists as life coaches. I thought, yeah, let me just try that out. I've never seen a psychologist beforehand. Let me try it out. And I was setting goals and, and doing all kinds of things. And I said to her, you know what? I've, I've heard about this. I think I, my mom told me about this, this entry she had seen for MasterChef. I don't know why she mentioned it to me, but it was literally a case of, um, hey, this is, there's entries for the first South African MasterChef. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to enter this because I actually loved food. I mean, I, I, was a, I was a terrible chef. I mean, I, and I'm incredibly fussy. I am super, super, super fussy. Technical, offensive, fussy about everything, like flavors, taste. I don't, you know, and to me, I mean, I always wanted to be a chef originally, but it was, I was never going to sort of like touch like raw chicken. I was never going to stick my hand into a chicken carcass and pull out some, 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 some bits and pieces. I hate the smell of fish. I cannot do like sort of any form. I can't stand the smell of like prawns and crayfish and it drives me mad. Um, I, my fat has to have all the, I mean, my meat has to have all the fat trimmed off it. I'm exceptionally fussy with what I eat. Um, so I always figured, well, if you're going to be a chef, they're going to force you to do all these things. And, that, and there's no ways I'm going to cook fish. No ways. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I heard about this thing. I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to enter Master Chef. And, and I said to my um, uh, psychiatrist at that point, uh, like, well, I was just dealing with it as a life coaching sort of like experiment. Because I like to experiment with things. And I was like, I wonder what they'd be like, what, what, the, what their mindset is like in coaching you in life. I wonder if that'd be good. Um, I didn't enjoy the experience, to be honest. It was a... <laughs> Yeah, the mindset was too small. I find life coaches are sort of personally for me are far more useful. They sort of deal with things in a in a different way. That was that was far nicer. But um, I said to her, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter MasterChef and I'm gonna win it. I am gonna go hardcore and I'm going to win MasterChef at all costs. And even if they want me to eat brain, I'm gonna eat brain. And even if they want to eat like like you know sort of like like some animal's snout, I'm gonna do it. Whatever it takes, heart. I'm gonna prepare my mind to do this. So I had about nine months to go. And I decided, let me go hardcore into like experimenting with food. And I think that one of the things was just around that time, I remember one night I was making myself some dinner and I, I cooked up this meal. Yes, and it tasted absolutely crap. It was shit as a note. Um, <laughs> so eventually I was like, well, how do you make things nice? So I think, okay, well, I know you can either add like Miracle Whip, chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> tomato sauce, or cheese. <laughs> and yeah. I I'd added literally miracle whip. I think I'd added cheese. I'd added chili, uh, chili as well. And I went to that. I sat at a wall overlooking, like, like I was on a mountain top, and I sat on, I sat on the wall, and I was like, "This is disgusting." And I actually threw the meal away over the wall. Yes, cooking sucks. So I thought, you know, okay, cool. I've enjoyed cooking, like, like the concept of cooking, but I, but I wasn't really that good at cooking. Um, uh, well, I was pretty crap. Um, but I was going to go hardcore and then learn everything there was to know about food. So I started this journey where like literally in one evening, I'd cook 45 versions of one meal. I'd literally, like I get an idea at about like, like nine o'clock at night. I'd start cooking and I'd cook till four o'clock the next morning. I'd, I'd have like version one to 10, take the best version. You know, your version 10.1.A.1, you know, one, you know. And I, I cooked <laughs> versions and my house was an utter mess. But I'd, I'd come through the night and I'd been like, I had like, you know, a couple of bottles of red wine out. I had Rihanna music blaring out, <laughs> but absolutely passionate about food and thinking like, like, hey, what flavor actually is best? What actually works best as a, as a marinade? What does this? Have? And, I, and I would do that all the time, like weekends. On a weekend, I'd cook like 60, 70 different portions of meals. Um, and I'd just like, up and I'd like put them in my freezer and I'd give them away. So everyone around me at that point, you know, if you were a personal trainer or you wanted to lose weight or you wanted to just have, con I mean, I wasn't so much about the health at that point. It was more about just the experience, I guess. And I, but then eventually I started going towards, you know, sort of being more and more and more healthy. Um, but I'd give food, prep food to everyone all the time. And I mean, people's, people were eating for free for months around me. <laughs> and, um, I literally sort of experimented. And as I experimented, I remember one day just having this um, bottle of orange juice. And it said 100% orange juice. I squeezed orange, and, and I read it and, and, I, and I saw, but there's also... You know, there's flavoring, colorant, um, there's sugar, and there's actually a couple of preservatives as well. I'm thinking, like, what part of 100% am I not getting? You know, like, that is not a 100% would be just orange juice. 100% doesn't include sugar and flavoring and colorants. That's absolutely. And what I found as well, I was probably getting more and more fussy or better with my ingredients. I was having a lot more sort of like veggies than I've ever had in my life. 
and um, my taste buds were changing and I was also being a bit more sensitive to food. And I was having an orange juice and I'd get like a, a scratchy throat. I think that's weird. What is it? And I'd read the ingredients and I'm like, ah, this preservative maybe. I'd get something else with a preservative and I find scratchy throat. Huh. I'd feel nauseous after something. And I'd, I'd eat something and say, hey, I felt nauseous after that. What is that? What's actually in that? And I'd read the ingredients and it'd be like, hey, that's actually probably the, um, the nitrates or it's this or that. So it invents or whatever. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd look at these things and say, you know, and hang on a second, like, why, why do we have all this extra crap in our food? So um, I decided at one point, let me actually make my whole MasterChef thing all about cooking good food. It had to come from only natural ingredients. I thought this makes complete sense. I mean, where, where, where does flavor come from? It's got to be natural. And mm. where does like, good food come from? It's got to be natural. And then that was my whole thing. And as I built it up there, um, at one point I decided, let me live on my food only for like 21 days. I'm going to have on food that I've cooked with no preservatives, no additives, no added sugar, no extra anything, no added junk, no artificial anything. Let me live off that food for 21 days. So it was a lot of vegetables, a lot of roasted vegetables, and things like that, there, meats as well. I did that. And after 21 days, I was off um, my um, antibiotics for the first time in two years. Um, it was just after Ironman, so there was a guy just before Ironman, a friend of mine said to me, Wayne, if only you could lose five kilograms, you'd look much better. And this mm -hmm. guy was like, dude, man, I'm, I'm so fit. How can I lose five more kilograms? This is obviously what my body's going to do. I, I dropped that extra weight. And my focus was unbelievable. I could not believe how solid my focus was and how good I actually felt. So I decided, I realized that all diets fail for one reason, because you don't have good food available right now. And I thought, hey, this is cool. I started a company where I make good food and uh, just that's it. Anyway, it carried on. I got to the master chef day where we actually sort of enter. I cooked up a whole meal the night beforehand. I got it ready. It had to be served cold. And I, it, was, it was quite a complex meal. Um, I, most people were sort of presenting things like puddings and I was like, no, no, I don't do pudding. I'm going mm -hmm. to do something really healthy. And, my, and in the morning, uh, my, my cooler box got too cold. And it had to be, because you've got to serve your meal between zero and four degrees. Mine went minus five and mm. it froze my whole um, entry and I was like oh no so I recalled in a bit of a rush got I wasn't late for for MasterChef but I got there later than I should have um, and the queue was so long about two and a half thousand people standing in a queue we were about 40 degrees Celsius that day it was super hot oh, yes standing there with these like massive um, uh, cooler boxes full of ice and ice packs and all kinds of things you take a step forward and you put it down and you're standing in the sun and you are melting. Um, a lot of people who knew about food probably better than I did at that point, they were like sort of getting their, their, their parents to come and join them later on or their, you know, sort of like family or someone to come and help them and bring their meal to them when they got close to the front of the queue. So I had this thing dragging it along. Wow. And I got in front of the queue after hours and hours. I opened the box up and, my, and everything had melted and the whole thing had fallen over. It got wow. squashed. It was just a freaking mess. I was like, oh my God. And I had lots of backups. I had backup little versions. And I was like, oh no, this is not good. And I thought, you know what? I don't really care about the MasterChef anymore. Um, but you know what? I'm going to leave. And I just picked up and walked out. And thought, you know what? You've come this way. You've come all the way to the front. You know there's no ways you're going to get through now because my meal was squashed. And it, like all this, everything was just a mess. And, uh, but let's do it anyway. So literally on the side, I, I, I scooped together a couple of things, pulled a couple of sprigs out, put them all together put it on the plate and I, I just thought, I walked in and I thought, you know what, walk in as if you, can, as if you own the place, walk in <laughs> as if you, you know, you've got the best meal in the world. Although until I saw a camera, there was, there was these cameras as you walked in towards all the chefs to actually sort of present it to them and they were filming and I just put my hand over my head like this here and I walked in with a plate like this so they would never be able to film me ever. And I walked in, <laughs> um, the guy looked at me and I thought, I know what you're thinking. That looks shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking. And uh, I thought, you, but like, you know, if you knew how I've squashed that together, you're laughing at me, but I'm laughing at you because I've squashed that thing together. Anyway, that was the whole thing. I went out and I was like, you know, I was no longer sort of into the whole thing of doing MasterChef. I mean, I watched the whole season. I was big into it. And I, I, it was such a good experience of learning what food is about. And I mean, as I say, I, I did my 10,000 hours kind of thing that year of cooking to the extreme. But I got to the end and thought, hang on a second, my passion is healthy food. My passion is being healthy. It's feeling good. It's, it's having good focus. It's being in, in control of your emotions. And I want to do that rather. So yeah, it was a really cool experience though. Amazing. Yes, 
Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. Oh man, you must be kind of demoralizing in a way when you get to like, you know, the the front of the queue and you put in so much prep and the thing is basically melted. Oh, man. <laughs> it just is unbelievable. But uh, as I say, it was like one, went out and drank a few bottles of wine after that there just to sort of like, well, actually, to go and celebrate my failure. Uh, that, that was it, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then look, out of, um, you know, failures and things, a lot of things uh, actually are born and lessons are learned, you know. And like, I guess off the back of this, your your amazing business now, Fit Chef, was born. Um, and That's actually, b- before we get into the details of, of what Fit Chef is exactly, but m- maybe you can just, I don't know, like talk a little bit about, you know, transitioning from you know, the, the career and industry you were in to then into like a completely different one into the food one. Like how, yeah. how did, how, what were you doing at the time? And like, how did you kind of like manage this whole transition, you know, and you've got a family and all this stuff going on. It's, it's no uh, sort of easy task. That's for sure. That's, yeah. It was madness. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, I mean, like part of the transition was for some reason, I always felt I would own my own brand. Like I was kind of like, Part of my part of my sort of upbringing and and, and my sort of development through my career it was like, you know, do graphic design, go into web, um, go more into sort of like you know the uh, you know social media and app development, go more into um, actual proper management, client services, marketing, go you know do the full sort of set of services um, as far as marketing goes and, and as far as sort of like yeah marketing and design and all those things going connecting with people. And I always knew I'd have my own brand at some point. Um, when, when the concept for Fit Chef came across in my head, it was like, this is a natural progression. Like I've now added food into my, um, into my skill list. Um, I can now take all the other things I've learned in life, put them together into one big pile and apply them and, and, and have this like, you know, you've got all these overlapping skills like a Venn diagram and where, where they all overlap, food, um, marketing, um, copywriting, event management, um, web development, app development, all those things. Somehow you get this little lucky little hotspot where you think, hang on, this is going to work together. And that was my hotspot. It was like saying, cool, I've just added food. Now I know how to market the thing myself. I know how to build stuff. I know how to present because I did a lot of presentation on a lot of the apps we built. We had to go and do like trials and tests and, and presenting to crowds of people who had good bought our software, that kind of stuff. So, so it was a natural progression for me of, Hang on, it's all come together now. I can I can use all my skills together and build the brand, um, and that was it basically. Um, but there's a lot more to learn though. <laughs> as an entrepreneur. We we do forget a lot of things, but but it, it felt quite complete at that time. I was like, take the skills, put it together, and launch a company. It'll be so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's years of life experience all coming together, and that's the only way to get to that point. Sometimes is just living life to a point where you can just go it all comes together. You couldn't have jumped ahead of that 10 years before that, you know? Physically impossible. And you've got to give it the time. Like you've, you've always got to give it time to get into it. Because I still believe kind of in the concept of the 10,000 hours you need to spend on something, you know, or Malcolm Gladwell's book. Um, you've got to spend those 10,000 hours in a way. It's not always 10,000 hours, but it's the concept. A lot of time to learn the logic. And, and actually, I didn't have the right sort of words for it until lately. Um, um, I'll... Professor Tim Noakes, one of our chats on, on social media, he was like, why is it that doctors and, and medical communities don't seem to understand? Um, I mean, they've got all the information, but why can't they sort of apply the information to the real world? Why, why are we seeing doctors recommending like such you know, rubbish? <laughs> and mm. Tim Noakes himself said on, on Twitter, he said, you know what? What it's about is we've got to realize that there's a transition, is that you may have a lot of data in your head, a lot of knowledge and information, but that doesn't make it logic. And so the jump from actually sort of going from information in your head and data and access to data, we've all got access to all the data in the world at the moment. You've got to be able to sort of go through that hard phase of, of applying it and learn the logic, learn what it feels like and what the rules are like. And I think that was it basically, it was like, you know, like um, you've got to go through the process to, to learn the logic and, and train your brain to sort of think bigger. And, and that's kind of what it was about, yeah. Mm-hmm. Train your intuitions off the back of that, like uh, things like that become intuitive, but initially they're not. Initially they're not at all. Yes, you sort of, it's like, you know, it literally is like playing a game of, of like Monopoly or you're playing a, a game of Risk. And like, if you don't know the rules, um, like, like you can read the rule book like 10 times, but it doesn't always make sense until you're playing it. 
then while you're playing, you think, hey, I can break that rule, I can modify that rule. That's, there's a rule within a rule here. It's actually mm. just putting it together. It's, it's, it's pretty hard, but it's, um, it is the way to do it. You need time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. And so, so, so maybe, yeah, maybe just tell us a little bit more about, um, about Fitchef uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. And also, look, it, is, it was one of the strictest uh, food brands in the world, uh, as, you, as you say, and, and have, uh, you have a, a eat clean ethos. Um, yeah, exactly. so, so maybe tell us a bit more about Fitchef and, and what it is and, and what is eat clean? What is your eat clean ethos? Okay, so it was kind of going along, as I said, like going through food and, and, and experiencing food for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a sort of kinesthetic learner. You know, you know, I've got to learn by doing. I don't learn by, you know, I can listen, but I've still got to actually do it. So, so once I've done it and, I, and she's seen the benefits in you know, me sort of feeling so good and everything, I thought, well, let's launch a company, as I said. Um, let's we'll launch a company. And I came up with this thing called the Eat Clean Ethos. And lots of guys out there had Eat Clean, and they were like, Eat Clean? Oh, we've taken out sugar and we put in xylitol. And I was like, let's not eat clean. Uh, to me, eating clean is clean. Like, let's go back to almost paleo style rules where, hey, um, not as basic as paleo, but like sort of, let's, let's eat from nature, basically. Let's eat real food. So eat clean was about, um, is the food real? Um, so is it real food? Can I sort of find out where it comes from nature? Can I, can I see the link directly to nature? Um, are there no preservatives, no additives, no man-made chemicals? No added sugars or artificial sugars. Um, is there no extra junk in there whatsoever? And that was the ETM ethos, was to try and create the most natural form of food to the extreme, but it still had to taste good. And I mean, initially when I learned, um, launched, it didn't taste that great. I must admit, it was actually more like I was trying to shove cauliflower down your throat and spinach in huge amounts just to sort of like, you what good But they're good for you. Just eat them, you know, but they didn't taste so good, you know? So... It was a case of saying, okay, cool, let's launch a company where we provide a full solution. It had to have a very, very, very strict ethos. Like at that point, I mean, from the word go, like my whole thing was um, my, my tagline, one of the taglines I've got, and it was on my, on my first website, probably when I first built the first website and put it on the top, it said the, the world's leading real food solution company. So it, was, it had to be real, it had to be world beating, it had to be a solution. It wasn't just like, oh, here's a meal. You know, like I, I can give you a meal, but I, but I can't change your life. It was about a, a food solution. Like, you know, here we are, we, we're all too busy. Um, everyone is too busy. And I, I one of the things in life is you actually, uh, I think you've got to just realize I am too busy. I will always be too busy. I mean, like retired people, you know, this is a bug me. It's like all the retired people around me, you know, sort of in family and everything. You think like when you're retired, you'll have way more time. I can never get a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Because they are living, their lives are just so busy, they're doing things. So once you realize that life is too busy and you've got to sort of like have a strategy to help you through life, then you've got to find a food solution, not just a meal, not just a sort of eating style. It's got to be a solution. Like on busy days, what can I eat? And, and, and that was Fit Chef. So I first launched Fit Chef. I thought, okay, cool. Here's the meals. I've made these cool meals. There was a limited range at that point in time, very limited range. Um, I wanted to know every single ingredient. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't using anything artificial because I always thought like, as soon as you put something man-made in there, at some point, like, I'll call it safe today, but in like 10 years time, it'll be like, actually, that was dangerous. Um, yeah. but I wanted to sort of just like stick to one rule. It's natural, it comes from nature. And in my sense, it's like nature knows best. It's going to always come back to the fact that like, hey, scientists came up with, with all kinds of baby powder, um, you know, baby milk powder but they still come back to breast is best, you know? Mm -hmm. They still come back to that because it is so important. And it's not just about protein and carbs and, and sugars. There's so much more in there. You yeah. know, your, your whole microbiome, your, your gut biome is, has been passed on from the mother to the, to the child. Um, there's, there's way more than that even actually going on. So the whole concept of FitChef was actually to create a, a real company, real food, a real solution, and make it super easy just to sort of like say, hey, I want to live a new life. I want to change my life. I want to be healthier. I want to be faster. I want to be leaner. I want to, I want to think better. I want to do whatever else. And just click on a button on our website and say, deliver me a 21-day challenge. Like At that point, um, when I first launched it, it was like, it had to be a 21-day challenge you get to buy from us. It had to have 54 meals, and it had to have 44 smoothies. And you could not buy a kit without smoothies, even though like it was like spinach and all kinds of things and quite like fibrous. I just had to be the real thing. And that's where it started was actually just like, you know, 
let's create a company that is absolutely pure without being boring. Like I didn't want to be a hippie company where it was like, hey, you're going to come to us and have to walk barefoot and be vegan. <laughs> it was more about come to us and be real. It had to be a real food solution company. Yeah. But it's incredible. I just love it. You know what I mean? Like, like literally, I, I'm like massive into health and cooking and, and uh, I, I always see all these companies like in the UK, you know, and they're like, oh no, we're super healthy and we're this and they're that. And then, you know, you'll test their stuff out and you're like, your stuff is just crap, actually. You oh. know what I mean? There's just so much rubbish in here. And then, and they're like advertising how healthy they are and whatnot. And it's, it's, it's actually really, really frustrating. Um, <sighs> But but how do you how do you like maintain these standards, right? Like it must be extremely hard to to not put in like the preservatives or or certain like flavorings or stuff because um, you know also stuff I guess needs to last as well, you know, and it's yeah. uh, and and you're doing it on like a you know a sort of commercial basis, like a big sort of uh, scales of of production. So how do you actually maintain that? Wow. I mean, it's, it really is quite a challenge. And I think sort of most people sort of who are not in the food industry, and even if you're in the food industry, people don't always realize how hard it's going to be to produce stuff that is sort of real things <laughs> that hasn't got the, on the sugars and the thickeners and the starches in there. Um, so maintaining it is unbelievably hard. Like it has been like, so we've been going now sort of properly commercially for just, uh, you know, six years coming on seven, I guess. And um, I thought, you know what, like this, this is going to be easy. We're going to just produce food from nature. We're going to just roast vegetables and do things and some spices, and it'll be the most awesome food immediately. Well, when you go commercial as well, commercial commercial food is very, very different. So, I mean, producing one meal or like, I mean, take chicken. Go and cook like one bit of chicken. It's super easy. I mean, like, you know, uh, people mess it up even then. Um, but mm -hmm. now I'm going to go and cook like, you know, a couple of tons worth of food in one go. Um, you know, literally a ton of chicken arrives, we defrost, we cook that becomes incredibly hard. And like basically you've got to just carry on putting in better and better principles. So literally, I think um, what's made a difference with us is, okay, so, so initially we launched a whole bunch of meals, which were, I mean, like were pretty good, <laughs> but they weren't that good. <laughs> they, were pretty, they were very good for your body. Very, very good for your body. We had people sort of, all kinds of like illnesses disappeared. Um, and then we sort of decided this has to taste good as well. And that's been a six year journey of literally mm -hmm. sort of through every single batch we taste. So every single batch arrives, um, we literally are tasting the batch, making comments, we adjust. Because unfortunately, Mother Nature um, is, ne is never consistent. Mother Nature is always throwing different things at you. Like, you know, the tomatoes are more red now, and they're more acidic, and they're more watery. Or they, or, they, or your, your, your garlic is super strong, or your lemons are acidic and bitter. So you're, you're always adjusting. So every single batch we do, and this, 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 this whole idea, doesn't fit into the normal profile of, of, of doing commercial food because commercial food is like, I've got a recipe and you can't change it. Mm -hmm. You know, recipe for life. We've said it, it's all perfect, but it's not the way it works. It's because if I was using, you know, like if we had to use things like add sugar when, when the tomatoes arrive and they, and they aren't good, uh, that's breaking the rule, but it would be easy. Um, I mean, like, let me go back one step at you. Like for instance, when we make soups, at the, we often sort of working in or in certain things we do, we work in shared kitchens. And, and, and I see them producing soups for um, other companies. There's a whole bunch of, you know, it's an ISO 22,000 kitchen, very high levels. And you see them, you know, uh, pouring water into these huge um, um, pots. And then they see them pouring a whole bunch of white flour and, and colorants, mm -hmm. sugars into them. And then in goes some vegetables, they blend them, and it's out. We put, like, you see us walking through with like barrows, you know, these huge like sort of stainless steel barrows, <laughs> just more and more fruit and vegetable and everything. And they pile it in, pile it in. Um, in, in an hour and a half, hour and a half to two hours, we'll make maybe like a 300 liter of, of um, soup. Our competitors are making 1500 liters. You know, it's like wow. more because they can just chuck in like, the, you know, the, it's, it's all the powders, all the, all the flour, all the white stuff, and mm. put it, blend it, and it, and it thickens nicely, and you get it, and you think, "Wow, this is this is real, this is real." But it's not. We make real stuff, and it takes us an incredibly long time. The yields are very low. The pricing is very expensive. Mm. We have to deal with bugs, stones, um, like little twigs, and everything like that. There, there's brown spots on everything because we're using real food. And so, 
you know, very often that, you know, like it's, it can take us sometimes even like 18 months to launch a new product. I mean, we, um, uh, the ice creams we've got, you know, ice creams, how do ice creams fit into a healthy diet? We thought, well, you know what, you're going to eat an ice cream at some point in time. You're going to need to sort of cheat and, and, and treat yourself. Let's do an ice cream. So it was like, let's get good ingredients. And it was literally this uh, organic milk, um, egg yolks, cacao for the chocolate version, um, and, uh, and honey. That was real products. But it took us 18 months to develop those four products to work in a way to find a method. 18 months of trials to get there. If I just use like um, what most guys do is they put in starches and thickeners and sugars mm -hmm. in, in ice cream. That just works immediately. And we often get people coming back to us saying, ah, here's a nice clean product. Here's a nice clean, um, actually like we even sell it on, on the shelves, a nice clean coconut milk. And it says no preservatives, no additives, no chemicals. Um, and you go and we have it tested and there's five preservatives. There's two stabilizers and there's a whole bunch of preservatives in there. It's like, what the hell guys? So there's a lot of line going on that sort of in, in the industry and it's very, very hard finding clean, real products. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. Wow. Yes. Man. That's fascinating, man. And it almost sounds like you, you're almost more in like winemaking and it or like, you know, you, you're not just set and forget it's, it's you, you, you're involved the whole time. You, every step of the way you, you quality control and, yeah, it's, it's a massive feat. And I was just wondering in terms of the, uh, the uh, preservatives, if you can make food without preservatives, right? Um, like you guys are doing, why yes. is it so prevalent? It, does it, does it lengthen like the time that you can have it on the shelf or, or what is the actual yeah. purpose of it? Totally. So, so, okay. So our food is all frozen. So just, just to, to clarify as well, our food all comes frozen. So, so we're a frozen food brand because if you're going to have no preservatives, you're going to have to sort of preserve that food somehow. Now, mm. it is by far the best way to preserve things. I mean, like you see how they pull out woolly mammoths out of, out of the uh, ground, you know, in snow. I've been frozen for like many, 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 many years. Um, and um, freezing is, 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 is nature's most sort of efficient way of, of sort of like storing things. But now the, the way to achieve the quality there is actually fast feeding, so blast feeding, so we can get them down to like low temperatures within literally sort of minutes, you know, sometimes. Mm. So that's the whole thing. Now, why the others are using a lot of preservatives um, is like for two reasons. One is obviously to preserve the, the uh, shelf life. So you, you want your food. I want it to last, it's got to last like for instance, 12 months or it's got to last so many months. I mean, because they will freeze it sometimes as well with preservatives or mm. it's, a product, it's got to go on the shelves or you'll have a jam or a sauce where you know preservatives in the sauce because the preservatives will keep it um, fresh and looking bright and clean and, and colorful without, mm. anything, you know, um, it'll sit on the shelf, it'll look nice. Um, but the problem actually is also when you open it up, you take a spoon and you take that spoon and you take a lick and you put the spoon back into the actual, um, you know, sort of sauce, mm -hmm. your saliva and it goes back in there. So preservatives do have a role to play in that there. Um, mm. And I think that there probably is a good time to, to use them. I mean, like originally I was like, no preservatives at all, never ever have preservatives. But I, now I'm like in a case, case where, like for our brand, we will never use preservatives. But I think there are times in life where you need something to be yeah. and and like also so don't be an idiot about it and say let's ban everything. I think how do you use them sort of in a in a in a in a more logical and um, yeah clever way? Like for instance, okay, so there's a thing called the law of Paracelsus. So there's a guy, the father of toxicology, Paracelsus, he came up with a, a, a rule many years back, and he said um, it's the dose that matters. So basically. Mm -hmm. so saying is that like everything is poisonous it's the dose that matters so literally if you have too much water it could become dangerous for you if you have too much oxygen it becomes dangerous for you whatever you have in life um, it becomes dangerous now the thing with, with preservatives are preservatives bad for you in small doses i'd probably say you test it and, and probably they're completely fine for you in small doses the issue is everyone uses the preservatives and the additives the colorants and the flavorants nowadays you have got no more control over sort of how much of those um, additives and preservatives you're getting. So if the law is that everything is poisonous, it's the dose that matters, but you can't control the dose of something that you're getting, then actually mm -hmm. sort of like say abstain. I, I want to control my life. I want to control my quality of my food. And it's all about quality. Let's leave the preservatives out. And like once in a while when I do have them or I'm drinking water and there's preservatives or I put face cream on my face and there's something in there that does something, mm -hmm. Rather be a bit stricter. So in the modern world, I think we need a yard. So, so, so preservatives have their place, I would say, but, but they're overused. They are absolutely abused mm -hmm. by 
the, the uh, commercial food industries. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So, so while we're talking about it, like people don't necessarily know how bad certain foods are and, and things are uh, it, within the food and that kind of thing. So maybe you can just give us some sort of an indication, uh, maybe without totally scaring us, um, if that's possible. <laughs> well, I mean, if, so for instance, like one of the big things I'm really sort of like um, watching at the moment is your your gut biome. And I won't go into the gut biome now, but just to mention, so we all know that your gut is really important. The, the bacteria that live in your gut basin sort of run your whole body. I mean, the reason you digest and the reason a lot of your body functions work is because of all these bacteria that live in your mouth, on your skin, in any sort of like premise you've got in your body, there is bacteria that is very, very, very beneficial, a real sort of symbiotic relationship. Now, if your gut bacteria is out, uh, we're seeing links to everything from autism, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, I mean, cancers, migraines, um, everything. I mean, everything out there, you know, Alzheimer's, the whole city. Um, now, the problem is, like, we've been told, for instance, that, like, something as simple as, like, the whole movement to say, no sugar added. Or, and what they do is, they, they then go and add three types of artificial sugars. Now, in a lab, when they want to shut down your um, microbiome in your stomach, they want to flatten your bacteria in, in your gut, they are literally using, um, um, with, with rats and with other things as well, they are using um, artificial sugars. Huh. Shut down and, and damage your gut bacteria so they can reset you and see how you react. Now, this is something we told about, you know, by everyone. It's totally fine to use, you know, the xylitols and the whatever else, um, the erythritols, sucralose, and all those things. It's not <laughs> because actually uh, the damage that it's causing, we, we are not, we, we cannot think in terms of, you know, proteins, carbs, sugars, and fiber anymore and fats. You know, you've got to think like food is not just like, those little, you know, four or five little things and a, and a bit of vitamins and minerals. I mean, that's getting mm. deep. You're looking at sort of like, like code. There's code. There's, I mean, you've got toxins in there. You've got things that, things in there that can make you sort of like completely high. There's things in food that obviously we know make you high. There's food that make you low. There's foods that affect your emotions. Food is code into your body. And the reason is it's affecting your gut biome. So even something as simple as it's okay to use artificial sugars because sugar is worse for you. When they found that, when they done tests um, for um, 11 days, they did tests at two different groups, one group with um, normal sugar added uh, uh, and one group with, with all the artificial sugars, they found the group with the artificial sugars had much higher blood sugar than the other groups. So, you know, mm. you, you just can't trust what's going on, I believe. Yes, You've got to back to nature. Yeah, yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah, it's super scary, man. Like, you know, and, and like you said, the, the issue is, is that it's in everything. That's, that's the actual problem, you know? So you, you, you can't avoid it. Well, you know, you can totally avoid it, but like, you know, people want the kind of ease of just kind of buying, you know, buying stuff and then making their life as easy as possible to cook and whatnot. And, and when you do that, it's in everything. So there's no, there's no like rest from these things. You're constantly mm. putting your body, like, you know, this stuff in your body and, and that's the issue, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're like, like you're only finding out, 20 years later or whatever that this was the cause I mean, yeah. like you know i mean uh oh, it's, it's ridiculous you know so i rather just, just trust trust nature like don't be a hippie but trust nature <laughs> yeah yeah no totally but totally man and um like tell us maybe about some of the success stories that you've had with fitchev because there's been some incredible oh. you know changes in people. moments yeah so so actually um i mean we've had just on a staff level, I mean, like, you know, so originally we, you know, we, like, we grew incredibly fast. I mean, like, you know, like the first three years, we just doubled in size. And every day you needed a bigger, more trucks, more, more staff, more people. And we, we kind of just said, like, if you could start work tomorrow and you were available and you could work a computer, just, just arrive and we'll hire you. So we had a lot of people <laughs> who, were, who were pretty sort of like overweight and um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases and, and, and issues. So we had staff arriving and literally losing 40 kilograms. They, they come on board. Um, it really felt like I remember sort of dealing with some of them thinking, my goodness, these people are not conscious at all. They're, they're, they're just like, they arrived at work, they're super overweight, very unhappy, um, autoimmune diseases for the last like 30 years kind of in their lives. And the, they come on board, drop those 40 kilograms. I would see this massive change happening in their consciousness. I should have worried about some of them at one point, although like, I've seen such a massive change in their thinking style. But I'm actually worried about sort of how they communicate with their existing friends and the existing mm-hmm. family. 
because or their circles because I mean there's been such a mental change then the physical change I mean you know we have people who who had um, I mean horrific autoimmune diseases that we are a one PR agent and uh, she had lupus 22 years living on like literally a handful of tablets every morning uh, she's on our food uh, for um, three months also did a bit of work um, emotionally as well and literally uh, in three separate um, tests the doctor was like I've never seen this before where has the lupus gone like I have not seen this it must be a broken test center again have another test and eventually said okay something's wrong with this lab I'll send you to another lab and there was no signs of lupus and, and, and we get this all the time we get people sort of coming to us I mean I've got a guy um, even on, on like some different things, not sicknesses, but like there's a guy who's um, a grandmaster of memory. I mean, he's, he's really high level. So he's had to uh, memorize 10,000 digits of, of pi. You know, there's lots of digit numbers. And he's had to go through a whole test where you've got to recall them in certain sequences and you do all kinds of tests on you. And he beat the world record by 15 minutes. And he's, he is basically a grandmaster of memory. I mean, this guy just like, he's got a whole bunch of books out on the New York, um, yeah, yeah. I, New York Times, um, you know, best awards on certain categories. And what about us? Um, phenomenal. To me about, about two, three months ago, he said, Wayne, um, I want to work with you. Um, he says, okay, I don't need any more, you know, like he says, I've done well in my career. I'm well recognized. I'm a grandmaster of memory. Um, he says, I've tried all kinds of things. I've tried all kinds of drugs to help me, to improve my memory, to make me sharper. I've tried uh, nootropics, you know, mental enhancement, enhancement um, chemicals and, and products. I've tried all kinds of things. He says, it's amazing. When I'm on your food, my mental abilities, my memory, my recall is the best it's ever been. And he says, you know, mm -hmm. I've tried other food. He says, like, I don't want anything from this. He says, I just want to come and tell you. because um, He says, like, maybe we can work together on some stuff and we're going to be working together on a few things. Um, but I just want to tell you that I, when I'm on your food, I am better. My memory is better. I can feel it. My body feels it. My mind feels it. And that, that's pretty incredible. I think, you know, I mean, people coming to us i mean like the, the amount of stories we get from people about lives we've changed um people who are you know who are living on our food now and uh, there's a couple who ran the comrades many times and they were still massively overweight and um eventually went onto our food and they lost the weight and like whenever they've gone off our food they pick up weight again and back on our food they drop it and um as a, and they buy all their food from us from the last six years they buy all the food from us and literally we heard a story of about someone saying you know what we actually, um, we heard about this family where they said uh, they were living on our food and a friend asked them and said, like, how do you guys afford to live on Fit Chef like all the time? And the guy was like, you know what? It's worked so well. You can see the difference to my running. You can see how well I, I look. You can see my health. You can see all kinds of things. Um, what you got to do is, is we decided as a family that we wouldn't buy a new car this year. We would rather put the money and invest it in Fit Chef. And actually, so, I mean, the, those are massive stories and you get those all the time. Yes, man. Oh, it's beautiful. Very inspiring, buddy. <laughs> it's super inspiring. Uh, and also, it's just such a good reminder of like you, if you want to feel good, look good and perform at your best, you have to put some effort and time and money into these things. But there, there are options for you and um, just such great stories, man. Thanks for sharing those because, I mean, they, they actually, they, those are stories you've heard about. There's going to be a whole bunch that you don't even have a clue about probably. That are, totally. that are exactly the same and and that's the the magic and it's it's taking it back to basics once again we 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 just always want to overcomplicate, our, especially with health stuff you know there's always a bloody potion or a, a pill or a something and we can just bring it back to like the inside out philosophy get your tummy get your body everything working well and put the right things in it and off you go it's just just really great so maybe you can give us like your main tips for people to eat properly and, and have sort of the, the basic understanding of correct nutrition. Cool. So, okay. So it's actually sort of far simpler in, in words, but the, the, the actions are always a bit harder. So okay, basically eating well, what is it? Um, whenever I ask a group and I say to groups, when I talk to them, like, where should you be getting your food from? You go into the supermarket, where do you find good food? And everyone knows, everyone knows, you must go down the vegetable aisle. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, if you head down your sort of like vegetable aisles on the perimeter of the store, you've got your veggie aisles, you've got your fridges, you've got your freezers, so you've got your meats. But everything that's sort of in those aisles there, that's where you start. Um, basically, I would say to you, get past the whole thing of saying, oh, you know what, I'm not allowed to actually have like 
colorful veg or that veg is too sweet or that this veg is too this or whatever else. I mean, obviously, it's all about quality and fiber and like real food, nutrient dense food. So start with like sort of real food, like, like you know, your fruit and veg. Stop being scared of, of um, fruit. People are too scared of fruit. I think with the whole sort of banting and the keto movements and the low carb movements, people are so scared about, you know, just like fruit is too sweet, you know, it's bad. And, and there are instances where you've got to control the amount you have. So, okay, so first of all, start eating really healthy food um, from nature. Um, problem actually is when you walk into a store and you, okay, and then obviously, you know, also limit your bread. I think bread is one of those big things you sort of really, really can limit. I'm a big believer that the, there are good breads out there. I mean, like, you know, your sourdoughs and your, and your rye breads and some of those real old fashioned style, like mm. proper are amazing for you and I, I, I but like don't make bread your staple really sort of cut it down because you need to drop your 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 you need to raise your quality of food and drop your um uh, uh carb level as well so eat healthy but unfortunately when you walk into a like a like a vegetable aisle you don't really want to go and grab a thing of butter and eat it you've got to do something to them so, so this is the issue with eating healthy like we know we must eat healthy we must drop our bread get rid of sugar Get some good oils like olive oil, stick to olive oil for basically everything. Um, you know, get some sort of decent quality yogurts in there. Well, if they work for you, that is. But the problem is you've got to prepare the food. Um, good food takes preparation. So otherwise you've got to find someone who's, who's got food like us. You say, cool, I trust this brand. I know they use all these good products, like a wide, diverse range of products, including beans and, and chickpeas and lentils and all those kind of things as well. Or you've got to go and actually say, let me actually spend some time cooking. Now, Roasting is one of the best ways to actually sort of live it. If you're going to cook for yourself, um, roasting and going for sort of whole food versions of food is the best thing to do. So take a whole bunch of vegetables, greens and everything, cover them in, in olive oil, some, some good quality, you know, um, Himalayan or Kalahari salt, um, sprinkle them, get them into, a, into, into an oven and prepare. Because the big problem with it is like good food doesn't last unless you actually do, because you put it in your fridge, you've only got about, you know, three, three days probably where, where it will go off. You've got to freeze good food, I think. In the modern days, if you, if, if you think and we agree that we're all too busy, you've got to say, let's prepare. Let's actually um, like make good food, lots of sort of variation of colors and different vegetables and meats and quality, quality things. But let's actually sort of then make them and freeze them. Then you've got like sort of unlimited amounts of like, I can grab a meal. And, and the issue then is that people think, well, you know, like, I don't want to eat like the same meal again and again. You can take things and make different sauces and you can get some, some brown rice and whatever those kind of things, mix them up and make some really awesome things. Uh, sprinkle good old, you know, feta. But look for the real food, quality food that hasn't got all the junk added to it. Because unfortunately, everything on the shelves is generally a mix of flavorants, colorants, and, and all kinds of sort of weird things. The next thing is portion size. So portion size is absolutely crucial. We eat too much. I mean, I would say around about the sort of 300, if you're eating uh, dense, nutrient dense food, so you, you know, take, taking like, for instance, take a whole bunch of tomatoes and onions, blend them up, put them in a pan or, or a pot, and I, and I reduce them down to a thick sauce. That's a thick, thick sauce. I mean, I've, I've actually sort of lost probably about 50% of my, of my water off that there. And you've got a really, really good tasting sauce with basil and things like that there. You know, um, if you've got food made from roasted veggies and proper quality meats, you know, you're, I do believe in grass-fed meat, um, and I believe you need some meat, and I don't think we need as much meat as we think potentially. So what you've got is, so the portion size should be about 300 grams uh, for almost everybody. I'd say, you know, obviously, you know, if you're a smaller person or you're more hungry or if, you, if you've had a, a cheat weekend the day before or, you know, you've eaten pizza yesterday, you're going to be more hungry today. But about a 300 gram portion around that 250 to about maybe 340 is about the right for sort of anyone. Now, I mean, we've, we've had... Um, Springbok rugby players who are 120 kilograms of pure muscle playing in the um, in the actual World Cup, and uh, the guy's eating like 300 gram meals, and he says to me, "Wait, this meal is actually the perfect size. It's the perfect portion." I eat, you know, four or five meals a day, but as a 300 gram portion, it's actually a great portion. The body doesn't sort of like overdo it. You know, once again, it's the law of Paracelsus. It's the it's the, it's the quantity that matters. It's, it's the quantity makes it poisonous. So it's, it's better. So, so I'd say portion size and then sort of eating and don't eat. Like you don't always need to eat. We, we become so obsessed with eating all the time, especially if you're eating a junk meal. Okay, so if you're eating rubbish food, you're going to carry on eating and eating and eating and you'll never get full. 
if you're eating high quality food, you're going to eat, 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 stop, and you'd be like, hmm, now I'm full. I actually really, really can't eat because there's fiber and nutrients actually in there, but mm -hmm. all kinds of things, good oils. Um, so, so that's the sign that you're eating good food is it always is high quality and you can't, your, your red light comes on and says, please stop eating. I am full. That's basically it. What, what you want there. Then also, I think sort of, you know, eating, not eating sometimes is, is as good as, as eating. Intermittent fasting, where you do like a, where you, you eat on some days, maybe two, three days a week. You, you only eat for a, a window, in a window of eight hours. So for instance, if you ate from midday to eight at night, that is an awesome way to actually live. It's like for three days a week, you only eat your, your two or three or three meals potentially and any snacks you have in those eight hours. And then you fast from eight at night until the next day. I mean, I even exercise on those days. Um, we exercise towards day three, four can actually sort of like get a bit weaker sometimes. Uh, but the quality that it does your body, you know, it's using up all the sort of like the junk, all the sort of bad uh, the bacteria and cells in your body. It makes you feel amazing. Your focus is good. So I think not eating sometimes is actually sort of as important. But it, yeah, so it's quality, eat quality, eat real food, uh, get as much fiber. Really, I think do focus on the fiber. The fiber is really, really important. Cut the, the white stuff, all, you know, like, like the sugars and the flours and the breads um, and manage your portion size. And certainly, yeah, get quality water in as well. You need about, probably about, yeah, I'd say aim for about two liters a day, you know, 1.6 to 2 liters a day, 2.2 liters if you, I think that's really important as well. Um, and um, intermittent fast. And even go for sort of like maybe 24 hours of fasting every now and then. It is such a powerful technique. And that's basically it. But nothing's going to work unless you plan. So if you are too busy and you actually can't plan and you can't cook ahead of time and you can't cook you know, on a weekend and cook like 20, 30 portions, you are going to sort of like, like fall off the wagon. You're going to get hungry. You're going to go and buy a pie. You're going to wish you hadn't. Um, and, there, and there is a time for celebration as well. I really believe. <laughs> Um, to go out and celebrate and have a pizza and, and do those things. We're not going to be boring, but get the balance of your life right. Your gut bio, your, your gut bacteria needs six months at least um, of even good eating to actually reset itself. So see what your, what, your, what your diet looked like over the last six months to really get an understanding of your health. It's not about the last two weeks, a week, or five days, whatever it actually is. It's about the last six months to a year. What on average have you been? You are what you eat, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super, super great advice there. But but just before we carry on, um, do you mind if we carry on for like another fifteen or so minutes? I know. It, Perfect. Is, yeah. is that okay with you, bud? Cool, man. Oh, thanks. Thanks, man. Um, thanks, man. So just a couple of things there from me. It's interesting. I watched this like TED talk ages ago, and uh, it, it was this Australian lady, and she was talking about health and stuff. And she's like, "It's amazing how we've been led to believe that like a banana." is like so like unhealthy for you or like whatever has too much sugar but then uh, a protein bar like that's what you should be having you know what i mean like oh. a, this chocolate pro it's like it's ridiculous <laughs> what the kind of marketing tactics are and and it's uh, you know we we really and unfortunately not everyone's aware of that you know so um, unfortunately yeah and, and if, you know what happens is when, when your energy drops so you go along you, you're living your day your energy drops next thing you're like i need something now and the longer you wait the more sugary and carby and carby you want. So you're gonna go and grab something really junk. Where's actually you know what? Like just chuck a banana in. I mean, it, it really there's there is a difference between like sort of like fruit and, and just pure sugar. It, it there's, there's a lot of benefits, yeah. So so I fully agree. Yeah, for sure. And and, and Gareth, the programming yeah. as well, before you move on, like uh, what I've always what you said as well, Wayne, is like so many times we've been told, you know, we uh, we need to constantly be eating. That was a like that was quite a common theme with like personal trainers and stuff as well. Like you need to eat like six or eight times in a day. That's the only way to keep your um, your digestive system working. And and you sort of saying no, that that doesn't necessarily um, doesn't work. that programming we've been used to. Yeah, and I think look here. So what I like here as well. Okay, so so there's actually sort of everything. Two different two opposing ideas can be right at the same time. So one way I'm saying to you, don't don't eat all the time. Have lots of fasting. However, all of these different eating techniques are tools, but there may be a time when actually eating more regularly is a good thing. So once again, bringing in this change into your system. So, so I would say in general, like, you know, like eat less, um, you know, sort of like reduce your eating, have days where you skip and, and, and you don't eat at all potentially. And then potentially if you feel like, I mean, like 
I did intermittent fasting for many years and I, and I pushed it quite extreme. And I was having a lot of coffee while I was, uh, while I was fasting and I pushed it and I do hard exercise in the mornings. And I found eventually I was actually just not getting enough food in. And actually I, I found my training was, was dipping. So then, I, and then also what I did over many years, I actually slowed down my, my metabolism quite a bit. So I got to the point where I thought, okay, now I need something else as well. I need to actually sort of re-boost the metabolism by actually eating more often. Um, but I think in general, eat less often, give your body um, time to actually have a break, but also realize that if you're feeling that, if for some reason you just feel, for a day or two, I'm going to eat more often. Why not use it as a tool? So it's, it's the whole thing, what I'm, what I'm trying to do with people is, is not get these, like sort of like, this is the strict way of eating. It's like, in general, this is the way you should eat, but once in a while, change it up. Go and eat two pizzas and just let your body go like, oh my God, what? this is all this crazy um, my system and sugars and fats. Um, let your body react to that then see what it does basically. But if, so I think you've got to use it as tools. But um, there, are, I mean, there are instances where eating often, like if, you, if, you've, got a, if, you, if you've got burnout, um, so sometimes eating more often can be good, Fair but enough. it will not. Yeah. So, so it's a tool. Yeah. <clears throat> love about, I love it, bud. So thanks for the permission for me to go have two pizzas this morning for breakfast. I'm pretty yeah. excited about that. <laughs> um, but 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 also like you, you've touched on it, um, you know, quite quite a bit already. But let, let's go like a little bit deeper into the importance of gut health and uh, you know. Our cool. Microbiome. Awesome. I think you know um, more and more and more we're going to see people talking about your gut being the most important thing um, in your body um, and. There's going to be a lot of people out there sort of speaking a lot of crap as usual. Um, what I always try and do is get close to the people who are the closest, what I call person number one. The person who was in the lab, the person who did the test, the person who actually physically, you know, did the testing, did the research, did the science. So obviously, as we've spoken about beforehand, old Bruce Lipton was one of those guys in the 70s. Uh, he was already sort of putting DNA out of uh, cells, removing DNA, cutting the DNA in half, Trying, thing, uh, trying all kinds of like, amazing things. And, and that's an awesome person. That's person number one. There's also someone else I've been dealing with um, um, who is actually like, like, phenomenal in, as person number one. He's uh, just come across him lately and, and his advice and suggestions, and he's got a whole American gut organization. He, his basic thing is this. Um, you are basically a, a bag of bacteria. Like if we, took, if we sequenced your entire body, um, and got the DNA, less than 1% would be you. 99% mm. of you is bugs. Now, the 1% of you is, you go for a DNA test, and, and it's awesome to have a DNA test and sort of know what your, what your DNA actually is because you have got presets. You know, are you, you know, your DNA tells you whether you're sensitive to um, um, carbs, whether you are sensitive to coffee, and, and how you will react with yo-yo diets versus very consistent diets. All kinds of amazing things from your DNA. But that's only 1% of your body. The other 90% of what makes you work and tick is your bacteria. And you've got, like, and we think of it obviously um, only as gut bacteria, but it actually you've got um, mouth bacteria, you've got skin bacteria. So you've got, you've got these little sort of like forests of bacteria living around you, actually floating around your body actually. You've got bacteria floating around you as part of your body almost. You've got bacteria in every crevice and everything like that. So, so what you're finding out is if you want to be healthy and you're only looking at the 1% of who you are and what you can do to affect that 1% of your cells, you're actually going to miss the boat completely. You've got to look at yourself as I am 99% bacteria. These bacteria form incredibly important things and do important things in my body. They literally make my whole body work. Like you wouldn't digest without them. You wouldn't actually sort of like have serotonin or your you, you know, you'd be lacking serotonin. I mean, like for instance, um, your gut, if your gut is happy and it's producing, you know, all the right things, it produces 50% of your dopamine and serotonin. So if you want to be happy, if your gut isn't happy, I would say it's physically impossible to be happy. Like on, on the sort of happiness movement, like I want to have a life where I'm fulfilled and happy. I've got to get my food right. I've got to get my emotions right. I've got to get my biome right. I've got to get my mental sort of condition right. All those kind of things in there. So it is critical to get um, your um, biome right. And there's more and more tests coming out. There's some pretty cool companies, day two, biome. But I'm, I'm actually really excited about the um, guys called the American Gut. You can literally send them a stool sample. So you can send them a stool sample. 
and they'll plot you onto this big diagram, which kind of looks a bit like about the like the world. You've got North America and South America, but all these little pockets of different kinds of microbes in your body based on their relation to each other. So what kind of microbes are there in your system, bacteria? And it will plot where you are. Like we've taken a, a, a fecal sample from you and you actually are reacting very, very, or, or like your fecal sample is, has got the wrong type of bacteria in it. And therefore you will have Crohn's or if you're, and they've linked basically sort of bacteria in the mouth, if, um, certain bacteria in the mouth show that you actually have, that, that you will have migraines, um, autoimmune disease, um, all kinds of things are, are going wrong. And they can now actually sort of track those. So it's, I mean, the science is becoming better and better and better. And it's better and better visual tools. Where are we going in the next 10 years, according to these guys, really, and, and, and you can do the tests already now, is kind of like almost having a, a toilet in your house. Well, there's two things he says. One is actually like a mirror in your house almost, that you could breathe on. And it'll be like, these bacteria are too high, that's too low. We recommend you need this bacteria. Eat some yogurt where you can get this bacteria or do this or go lie in the sand even. Sometimes it's just as simple mm. as go and get some soil bacteria into your body. Um, then he's saying, like, you know, like literally having toilets where you can literally take samples immediately and say, this is where you actually are. And there's people who are living like this already. I mean, this is not like science that's coming. People are already doing this. There's actually guys who've been tracking all of their, um, their uh, vital signs plus their, their, their general body biome, your, your, your bacteria, to see where you are. And there's one guy they had, he was a, he was a very high up um, you know, scientist. He tracks some amazing things, obviously. He's got awesome equipment to, to track his stuff, but he, could, he didn't know how to read the data. When they took the data that he had over the last many years, they put the data into a new interface they had. They tracked him and said, see, this is where you had Crohn's disease. And you, you were battling with Crohn's disease because your bacteria was off. See here where you changed your, your, um, your medication. It changed your, your gut biome. And you can see this is where you came out and you, and you were actually healed from Crohn's, Crohn's disease. So this is where we're going is actually, if you want to be, if you want to have a full picture of who you are, you're going to have to look at your gut bacteria. And how do you look after your gut bacteria? Number one on the list, according to these guys, um, number one is you want to have a very diverse bacteria in your system. As I say, mouth, you know, stomach, everywhere in your you know, skin. But the, the, the number one thing you can do is eat a vast um, variety of vegetables. So weird. Different vegetables, different fibers, different, different nutrients seem to sort of feed and enhance the growth of, of lots of bacteria in your system. So number one was eat a very, very wide range, not a diverse range of um, vegetables. Cooks every, every, every form, just get them in. And I'm not saying be vegetarian, I'm saying to sort of like go for the 80 20 rule, maybe a lot of a lot more variation. Um, your, your seeds, your beans, don't cut these groups out there, even a bit of bread, do it. I mean, get the bacteria in there. The next thing was actually sort of sleep or, or exercise and sleep. Exercise really does impact your, your gut, and it kind of got me thinking. I mean, often I run and I have this awesome runner's high, I'm feeling absolutely top of the world. And it's like, wow, this is, this is incredible. And I'm thinking, like, why am I feeling so good? I now realize that actually my, my hypothesis, my theory, my hypothesis is really, that as you're running and you're exercising, you are stimulating your, your gut biome, your gut bacteria. What that does then is it actually goes into a place where it's releasing a lot of dopamine and serotonin. I'm feeling absolutely awesome because I exercise. So it was, yeah, so eat lots of veg, um, avoid all the things that are killing it as well, obviously. Get away from all, all the sort of artificial food. Exercise, and exercise doesn't have to be extreme. I mean, like I've really, I've, I've injured myself so badly over life by being too extreme about this. Yeah. General exercise, be fit, move a lot, just move a lot. Then sleep is absolutely crucial. They, they were saying one of the biggest factors affecting your bacteria, because as you sleep, your bacteria sleeps. Mm -hmm. So after you have a bad night and, and your stomach feels funny, I think. I've also seen this, like you have a terrible night, you can't sleep properly, you're up and down, and your stomach doesn't feel good the next day. Um, so your gut going to follow the circadian rhythm of your body, you've got to sleep well. You've also got to control your thoughts. Every thought is an emotion, uh, or, or is, a, is a chemical. So every time you think and there's an emotion, there's a chemical release that does something in your body. Control those, realize that actually stress, stress maybe isn't real, stress is actually all perceived, because actually everything is just a thought, and you've come through the last 
you know, you know, 40 years of, of solving every issue in your life, you're going to solve the next 40 years of issues. It's actually not that bad. So that's basically it. I think so. Gut is critical. Um, part of sort of Fit Chef's goal, and I always knew I'd do this. I, I just didn't realize that I would be the guinea pig to, to achieve this and so many failures along the way was, number one, eat well. Because once, you, once your biology is working, eat lots of real food. Once your, your biology is working, you can get your um, exercise levels optimized. You can get your mind optimized, your, 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 um, your brain optimized, your happiness levels optimized. And I think that's where I'm going with everything. It's like, you know, like we don't just want, food isn't just about food. Food is actually the first step to happiness. Happiness is the goal in life. Um, you get there through your stomach and through your brain and through other things. You're going to make lots of mistakes. You're going to fall off the wagon a lot, but get back on the wagon. That's basically it. Yes, but <laughs> so <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a great uh, um, sort of monologue. Wow. Like, you know, for people to just sit back and uh, really just sort of, you know, no, seriously, like, but like take some notes because it's so important. You know what I mean? This is yeah. like, it's, it's kind of new age stuff for a lot of people, you know, and uh, it's, it's really, it's really fascinating. So thanks so much for, for sharing that with us, but just out of interest, who, who, what's the guy's actual name? Um, his name is, um, I've just gone blank on his name now. He's a fairly new, my, oh, Rob Knight. Rob, Rob Knight. Knight. K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, phenomenal, uh, runs the gut by the, you know, the American gut project. There's a whole, whole open source project that, that you can actually go and access all of his data all the results, all of his systems he's built, and he's open sourcing the whole thing of, of the gut biome. And the stuff is incredible. On YouTube, a lot of very, very, very good stuff. Um, he can be fairly boring in the initial sort of opening scenes, um, but his content is pure gold. And now what I like about it, as I say, he's person number one. He was involved in the gut biome project. He is the guy doing this stuff. He is the guy injecting his daughter with, <laughs> you know, um, he gets to his stories. We'll hear about that there. Um, and, and, and understanding things and monitoring himself and helping thousands of people around the world. And you can literally pay to have your, your um, uh, stools sent over and get your results and find out where you fit on this map. And it does change a lot, but it, every single day it changes, but it does, it, it's small little shifts. What you're worried about again is that six months. I mean, I, this is probably a mistake I've been making in some ways in optimizing my, gut, my body. I've been going, hey, cool, I can optimize my body in 21 days. And you can make huge shifts changes to your body in 21 days. There's no doubt about that. Even within 10 days, in three days, you can feel better. But what I'm sort of aware of now is that, um, especially from, from, from my, DNA, um, my DNA test that I got back last week, it was literally saying, like for me, like changing my diet a lot is not going to work. I've got to slowly decrease, or slowly increase things to get the best results. And then proof in the pudding is, you know, sort of as, as uh, Rob Knight says, it's the six month to, to a year, um, what, what has your life been like? What has your food been like over the last six months or a year? That's going to change your, your gut biome. You've got to be consistent mm. for a very long period of time. Mm. Yeah, I love that. We, we, we very much short-term thinkers, generally speaking. But I love what you're saying. It's, it's so important to look at our lives as a, as a whole. And, and when, I, when, you were, when you were talking there, it was just it became so apparent. You, know, you can access these windows in our body in different ways and and it but it, it affects everything else so we we have to be aware of of all of them put together and obviously there's a there's somewhat of a hierarchy like i think gut i agree with you is like is a massive thing but but you you can't uh there's like a triangle of of health and if you move shift two of the edges you can kind of get away with the other but at the end of the day you have to look at all of them and um it's just a great reminder and you know looking at things as a whole you know, you, you, your life is, you've thrived and you've done so many things and it's, you've got a, a lot of lessons to, to give us. And you, you've been an amazing businessman and a, and a competitor. Um, you, maybe you can give us your uh, great three-step philosophy to achieve goals. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is a crazy step that I have in my life. To achieve anything in life, really, um, and especially when I find myself sort of in limbo, when you've got all these things that you want to try and achieve and they're not happening. So whenever I've achieved anything in life of significance, it's always included these three steps. My first step is that you need to have an immovable deadline. So if you want to have a, have a goal, you need to set an, an immovable deadline that you physically cannot change. So for instance, like if I wanted to do Ironman, 
I'd go out and I'd, I'd physically book the race and um, I'd book my flights, I'd book my hotel. And so now I've got an immovable deadline that I physically cannot sort of push out. You know, when work gets busy or life gets busy or whatever's going on, I can't say, well, can you, can you please move the, the Ironman to like two weeks time, please, because I'm actually busy. You've got to set those goals and make them work. Number two is actually set a, set a financial um, goal or, or see, have, a, have a financial commitment to this goal. Uh, it must be sort of a fairly decent commitment where you feel pain if, you, if you're not going to meet the goal. So, for instance, with Ironman again or with, with business, often I, I sort of um, buy an expo uh, stand and I, and I book the expo. I then pay for the expo. I pay for the flights. I pay for the hotel up front. So now if I, if I pull out, I could say no to that goal. Like, hey, I'm not going to do the Ironman now. But now I've paid. I've got my family coming with me. Um, we're all going down. I've hired a car even. I've made a big commitment. And that's it. The next thing is make a public announcement. So make a public announcement that says to everyone, hey guys, I <laughs> am going to be doing this goal. This is, my, this is my goal, this is my deadline. This is what I'm gonna achieve because the ego gets involved in it and the ego says, you know what? So you, you can also say, you know, silently you could go and say, well, you know what? I'm not gonna do this um, Ironman anymore or this expo. Even, and I don't even mind losing that money. But actually what happens is you've told everyone and they sort of hold you a bit, uh, uh, you know, sort of to that goal and say, come on, you've got to achieve this. Come on, you know, like pick yourself up and, and go for it. You've got the right people around you that will say, pick yourself up, make it happen. So yeah, so basically, I mean, those three things, uh, set an immovable deadline, um, you know, make a, a financial commitment that's big enough to hurt you, and then basically make a public announcement. And it's very easy to make things happen then, even if you've got no, like strong willpower or, or stability or stickability or things are very complex in your life generally you're going to achieve most of those goals because you're forced to. Yeah. Great advice, man. That's great advice, but, and it's, uh, that's using the ego in a good way as well, which is super powerful. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but look, we've had such an amazing chat with you and there's, there's actually a lot of stuff that we, we didn't get a chance to touch on because you know, you have, you do have this amazingly successful business. So uh, we'll, we'll leave that, I guess, for, for another time just to talk about, you know, cause there's, Lots of people that are trying to sort of start businesses and, and, and yes. lots of advice that people are looking for. And we, we can touch on that definitely the next time. But like talking about goals in the future and just before Craig kind of asks you our last question, maybe you can tell us, um, you know, what you're excited about, what things you have uh, that are coming up uh, for, for you um, personally and, and as a business and then also where people can get hold of you. Okay, fantastic. So I think um, you're, where things are going, I think, in a way, um, I'm moving towards, as I say, happiness has been my main goal. You know, I want to be happy. Um, it's been a very elusive goal for, I think, me and everyone else in life. And what I'm doing at the moment is, like, any business you run or any like, relationship you're in, it does get very complex. And you have your good times and bad times. I mean, I think, like any business and any lifestyle, you get to a point where, where you're very pushed. You know, you, you, you've come through a lot of challenges. I mean, life is full of these big, big challenges. What I'm trying to do is, is apply like new concepts to, to how to run a company. Um, and it's quite a complex thing because here you've got a company where we were all excited about doing things the first couple of years. It's like your honeymoon period. And then you go through the whole phase of like, now I've got to make work happen and I've got to fight the suppliers and you've got to go to court with somebody and you've got to be sued by something and whatever else goes on. And life becomes less exciting. And now I'm trying to sort of go to the, and the next phase of saying, well, actually, let's reinvent how business works and, and how we work in business. Um, what, the, what the offering actually is to our customers and what the offering is to, to staff because it is very complex. You've got all these complex relationships going on. So the whole thing now is, I'm trying to use the concept of like, um, if you want to change the world, you change yourself. Um, because that's the only way. Because you try and change people all your life. And we all know the, the sort of the whole saying, you know, you, you've got to change yourself first to change the world. Uh, but, but like we all still ball, I pushed, like, let's change the world, change the world. And eventually when you change yourself, you find it far easier just to sort of be authentic and carry on like that there. So what I'm trying to do now is, as a company is say, let's change the company. Like, let's raise our, our, our excellence levels. So, I mean, our food excellence levels have gone through the roof. I mean, it's been a very hard journey. Our, our innovation is, 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 is literally going sort of like at a very steady pace at the moment. What I'm trying to do internally is, is to get this sort of like structure where we are excited to come to work, where you've, you've got a passion that's bigger than just having like 
oh, let's come to work and eat healthy or make healthy food. It's like, let's change the world. Let's, let's actually, but I'm trying to get a, the company to really reinvent itself now internally where people sort of feel that everything they do is about changing your life. Have a second, you know, you need more meals because it's going to change your life or you need these smoothies. Or actually, you know what? We should be changing that smoothie recipe because actually it's not actually as optimal as it could be. So that's what I'm trying to do. So innovation, excellence, um, and just dealing with clients, trying to change marketing to, to, to a level where we're going one-on-one -on -one marketing. You know, it's very hard to deal with lots of people. We deal with a lot of people now. It's very hard to try and introduce that one-on-one -on -one relationship again. So that's where I'm going. So yeah, so, so that's, that's where I'm going sort of business-wise. Um, Health-wise, uh, uh, certainly um, after a couple of big injuries and big lessons in life again, I, I feel that pain is the only teacher in life. Uh, <laughs> it is the only way I have ever learned, and I think most people around me have ever learned. You've got to have a moment of like explosion, and then that changes everything. So um, I've come to the point where I realize, you know, actually, I think moderation actually is a good thing sometimes, <laughs> and so is pushing hard sometimes as well. But I think sort of more, a bit more moderate, but more sort of gentle on myself sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just sort of be, find that happiness and actually sort of put all those, all those rules into place, all those lessons into place properly now. So that's, that's my life there. Um, and what was I going to answer as well? Um, How can people get in touch with you? Oh, uh, get in touch with me, yes. So basically, um, I think sort of social media is probably the sort of easiest way. Um, so we've got FitChef on Facebook. I'm on Facebook as well there. Um, or just get hold of me directly on wayne at fitchef.co.za on email. I'm a bit slow on email. Um, and I can get you, I'll send you my, my WhatsApp address as well. That's far easier to deal with WhatsApp nowadays. But I think sort of, uh, you know, Wayne at FitChef.co.co. I get into FitChef, um, FitChef Food on, on social media. Um, yeah, you can email us as well on info at, at FitChef.co.co. And that's it, basically. Yeah. Amazing stuff, buddy. Beautiful. <laughs> You've got... <laughs> Your life goals sorted out. It's, it's super inspiring. So as Gareth mentioned, uh, just our last question at Wayne, and the question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think it's, 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 um, it's being authentic. And I mentioned the word earlier on, trying to be authentically you. Um, one of the lessons in life, one of my mentors in life said to me, Wayne, there's only one thing you must um, overreact to in life. He said, that is your gut feel. He says, you must just... Hmm on overreacting to your gut feel. And every time I, I react to my gut feel, because that's actually being authentically you, there's a little something inside you that says, no, this is not working, or this is good, or this is bad, or just go and do it. And the gut feel is such an important part. I'm not saying don't apply um, your, your intellect and your, and your knowledge and all those kind of things. That's really, really critical. To sharpen your gut, you've got to learn these things. But I think sort of being authentic, having the guts to be authentic, because it's very, very hard being authentic, and keep fighting to be authentic. I mean, like, you know, you're dealing with all these things, you're presenting to people, you're presenting your ideas to people, especially as an entrepreneur, you're always giving people your ideas. And it, it always feels like you're getting sh shouted down sometimes because like, they don't see your vision. You've got to just carry on being authentic, listening to your gut feel, following it through, presenting that sort of gut feel and that and the knowledge and information in different ways to try and get them to sort of like understand where you're going with things there. So being authentic to me is, a, is an incredibly hard thing. Um, as the Americans very often say, when I've been to the US and a lot of Americans, there's a standard saying I've come across a lot of them. They're saying, you do you. You know, just find out who you are and you do you. Because that's the only way you're really going to be happy in life as well. Um, you've got to do yourself. You've got to do your journey and be authentically you. Perfect, Pat. Totally, <laughs> totally agree with it, my man. Totally agree with it. <laughs> and you know what, what just got, sort of like sort of uh, occurred to me then was like, we talk about like our gut feel and you're obviously talking about like how important your gut is and that, and there's like books about our gut being our second brain, you know, yes. may, maybe it's so obvious that actually it is our gut that controls us and not our brain. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, your gut, if your gut says it, then go with it. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah. So, exactly. I mean, yeah. there's a real reason why we call it the gut. Yeah, exactly. Gut feel. It's, yeah. It's, the bacteria telling you something as well. <laughs> exactly, but exactly, yeah. Cool, man. But listen, um, such an amazing chat. Seriously, uh, thank you for uh, for all your time, bud. And it's it's just it's just incredible, kind of sitting back and being an observer and, and listening to your story, man. And it's 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 really really inspiring, like what you've done and what you've gone through in your life, and like how you have just learned well first of all learned everything yourself you know like and you've just mm. gone ahead and done things but then you've 
learned from what you've done, you know, and you've like applied that and you've like just sort of observed what's going on yourself and then made changes to your own life. And, um, it's, uh, it's really great lessons for everybody, man. And, um, you know, these, these transitionary phases that you, that you just sort of kind of just like easily gone through, you know, in, in, in a way like it's, uh, it, it really, gives i think lots of other people sort of hope and encouragement to do the same because you know people are kind of stuck in uh, maybe jobs they don't like or or whatever the story is and they feel like that, that they've just got to stay there but um but you know your story is proof that that doesn't need to happen you know if you kind of uh, truly want something you've just got to make that commitment and actually go for it and uh mm -hmm. Um, anything is possible if you wanted to, you know, and there's, there's no excuses like, you know, in your scenario, you, you know, you've got family, you've got kids, you've got everything and you've still made it happen, you know, so what, whatever it is, doesn't matter how busy our life is, we kind of just need to make those adjustments and the commitment and go for it and you can do anything that you want and so so thank you so much for like sharing all of that with us and then also just imparting like your amazing knowledge but i was kind of like sitting back there going wow like um you know all this stuff around food and nutrition and and just like our overall wellness is um is something that all of us need to know more about you know so um, truly was just like really fascinating just sitting back and listening. So thanks so much, but uh, you, 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 you're a very inspirational guy and, and I'm so glad that we've connected um, and I'm looking forward to uh, watching your growth personally as a, per as a person and as a business. And then also, you know, hopefully uh, all of our relationship uh, going forward too. So um, awesome. thanks a lot, my man. Well, thank you so much. I mean, like you guys have got an awesome platform and uh, so like, you know, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, you guys really sort of had a really awesome sort of podcast a few weeks ago that, or a few months ago that changed my life completely and really sort of brought it all together. So this is like sort of home for me. Yeah. Um, you guys have got a great platform, great energy as well. And so good to be part of this. Thank you. Cool, man. Yeah. Thanks. Man. And just briefly from my side, uh, firstly, thanks for saying that. That means uh, actually way more than you could probably imagine. Um, that's why we do this kind of thing. And it just, uh, it's very grateful to, you saying that because someone like yourself, you know, that, that we look up to and we see you doing so much to say, to say that is just very a, a massive affirmation for us as well. So thanks for that. But, you know, when you were speaking, there were just a few things that, that really stood out for me. And I was actually on a, on a, a sort of a health seminar this last weekend. And one of the people was talking about becoming the primary oscillator and this was one of the coolest sort of ideas and concept I, I sort of heard of in a, in a while and and that's exactly what you're saying work on yourself to a degree that you become that primary oscillator around mm. you so that when you when you're moving into um, a business meeting or a or your with your family or whatever be that person that people gravitate towards and start to vibe with and the analogy was uh, grandfather clocks if they all if you put them all together they actually start to sort of tick at the same time because there's a sort of resonance in the in the area and and I thought that was kind of cool and I, I just thought of you when, when you were talking about that so so thanks for being that person because it, it definitely shows and and also your um, your ambitiousness mixed with your authenticity is a, is a sort of a unique mix. Um, and so yeah, keep that up and uh, we can't wait to, as Gareth said, just to connect with you more and, and just see where you're heading into the future. So thanks from my side as well, man. Awesome. Thanks to all. It's been fantastic. Right. Uh, Brilliant. All right, buddy. Cool, man. All right, awesome, buddy. bud. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging for change, snow.